Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you may be joining us. My name is Peter Arvo, and I will be your guide during the Torchbearer series. This is course B501, Suppressed Bible Manuscript History, and we're in Session 2. If you've missed Session 1, it is highly recommended to view Session 1 before continuing, since we will build upon the first session and there will be very little review. Not all Bibles are based upon the same Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek text. New Testament lineage streams in the unbroken manuscript chain of custody, also known as Uncoke, preserved by the torchbearers. If possible, before we begin, visit the website to obtain the most recent version of this lecture and the related documents. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few important quotes with you, which you might like to keep in mind as we go through this course. The first quote is, quote, The largest impediment to discovering truth is the belief you already have it, end quote. Although the origin of this quote is unknown, it's definitely profoundly true. The second quote is, These, meaning the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so the book of acts chapter seventeen verse eleven the third quote is he is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock and when the flood arose the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock luke chapter 6 verse 48 and our last quote is if the foundations be destroyed what can the righteous do psalms chapter 11 verse 3 without a strong foundation a person's faith can be destroyed and as we will demonstrate in this session many people have unknowingly been provided with a weak foundation for their house of faith but it can be made strong again this course is broken up into five main sections. Number one, God, Christ, Apostles, and Torchbearers, Antioch, Syria, and Jerusalem, and the traditional text. Number two, Influencers between the Torchbearer stream and the Roman stream. Number three, Roman religion and empire past the present. Number four, Influencers between the Roman stream and the heretical cult stream. Number five, Pagans, Gnostics, Heretics, and Cults, Alexandria, Egypt, and Mystery Babylon. And lastly, there's an extra bonus section including a chart comparing manuscripts of other religions to Christian manuscripts. Just to remind those new to this series that besides the references presented in this audio-video lecture series, additional references are also available in the supplemental lecture notes for these sessions. Also, many of the charts and diagrams shown in this lecture series are also available as separate PDF and JPEG files, which you can use for your own purposes according to the Creative Commons License Agreement. The reference areas of the charts at times contain high-resolution scans of the pages being referenced, with the pertinent information underlined in red so that you are able to quickly and easily read the reference text in its original context. Please see www.thetorchbearerseries.com for details. There are many questions that will be answered by the end of this session, including number 1. Is there an unbroken chain of custody of Jesus' preserved teachings? Number 2. Which modern Bible or Bibles are 100% reliable and why? Number 3. Did the Romanized Christians fully conform to what Lord Jesus Christ taught? Number four, why did Roman Emperor Constantine I alter God's fourth commandment? In this session, we will be using several charts with the primary chart called Chart of New Testament Lineage Streams Unbroken Chain of Custody. We recommend viewing this chart via a computer, smartphone, tablet, or having a paper printout available while we go through this session. As previously mentioned, please visit thetorchbearerseries.com to access the free supplemental high-resolution charts. Investigators and researchers are often faced with conflicting eyewitness testimonies between opposing groups. Therefore, we propose to you throughout this session to keep in mind which groups appear trustworthy to provide you with the truth and which do not. 
The groups we will start with, shown in the far right column of the chart, is before the time Protestants or Roman Catholics existed and are comprised of many diverse groups which have always existed since the time of the Apostles. They have existed in many countries and have been called by many names, but we have simply dubbed them the Torchbearers. A few of the names of the torchbearers include, in northern Italy, Waldenses or Vados, meaning valley, in Germany, Cathari, meaning the pure ones, in France, Tesserans, and in southern France, Albigenses, the country of Elbe, in the country of Flanders, Piffles, and in England, Valdensian Christians. We have just listed seven names, but there are over 25 names some of which were derogatory names accompanied by slanderous stories provided by their enemies. Around 30 to 120 AD, we have the apostles and the autographs on the New Testament manuscripts, the originals. These are the first torchbearers for Lord Jesus Christ, who began spreading the word of truth. There is strong evidence that the Apostle Saul, also known as Paul, brought the truth of the gospel to Great Britain. Besides bringing the gospel to Spain, see Romans chapter 15, verse 28. There are testimonies from the following twelve early church writers that Saul Paul made it to Britain in the Celtic nations. Clemens Romanus, Paul's friend, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Eusebius, Theodoret, Jerome, Nikiphoros, Chrysostom, Venansus, Fortunantus, Sophronius, Josephus, and Gildas. Also, just as in the previous lecture session, not all references are shown in this presentation, but are all listed within the supplemental lecture notes. A 600-page book from 1819 called an Essay on the Origin and Purity of the Primitive Church of the British Isles and its Independence upon the Church of Rome by William Hales discusses another early influx of Christianity into Britain. Quote, Britain, about A.D. 57, by Bron, the father of Caracius and his associates, who had been converted to the Christian faith during the seven years' residence at Rome as a hostage for his son's fidelity when liberated and restored to his kingdom in Britain by the Emperor Claudius, A.D. 50. Bron was probably converted by Aquila and Priscilla, St. Paul's fellow laborers in the gospel, who were then resident at Rome and formed the church there. The British church appears to have been established in the reign of Lise or Lucius, the great-grandson of Caracalus, about A.D. 177. End quote. The book also has information about Christianity's early induction into Ireland and Gaul. Of the early Christians in India, we read in Fox's Book of Martyrs, originally written between 1516 and 1587 A.D., on page 34 that the Apostle Thomas was in India. Quote, he was called by this name in Syriac, but Didymus in the Greek. He was an apostle and martyr, and preached in Parthia, northeastern Iran, and India. End quote. Of the early Christians in Africa, we also read in Fox's Book of Martyrs on page 35 of the Apostle Simon the Zealot, quote, He preached with great success in Mauritania, northwest Africa, and other parts of Africa, and even in Britain, where through he made many converts, he was crucified by the pagans in the year 74, end quote. The first generation torchbearers were those that followed the apostles and began to spread the word of truth to every part of Europe and beyond. By around 120 AD, the torchbearers had not only spread across many countries, but were also known under many names, including Waldenses, Linus, Paterines, Cathari, etc. This was later confirmed by the papal inquisitor, Rainier Sacho, and by the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, who was one of the translators of the King James Bible, as well as others. Please continue to keep in mind that the torchbearers cannot be considered Protestant or Roman Catholic, for neither existed at this time period. 
They were simply groups of people who wanted to exactly follow the risen Jesus' teachings and were carriers or bearers of God's words and truth, even if it cost them their lives. 251 AD, the Cathari Novation. According to several references, the title of Cathari meant the pure and was first assigned to those who followed an Italian pastor named Novation who resisted corruption and wanted to live a life of holiness and purity. Later this name appears to have been associated with many unrelated groups of torchbearers to denote their standards of holiness. It has also been documented that a group of torchbearers who lived in Germany adopted the name Cathari. 600 AD, the Vaudois. At least since the beginning of the 6th century, the name Vaudois, sometimes pronounced Vados has been used by the torchbearers which lived in the valleys of Piedmont, sometimes pronounced Piedmont. These valleys are surrounded by the Alps, the highest mountains in Europe and are some of the highest in the world, which act as a defensive barrier. The valleys are in the mountain range of the northernmost part of Italy, but the mountains also span France, Switzerland, and Germany. These torchbearers were also called Valenses, and later were known as Waldenses. 660 AD, the Cathari Puritans. The Puritans described here are not to be confused with the Puritans of the 1500s that immigrated to America, although the more modern Puritans of the 1500s may trace their lineage back to the Puritans of the 600s. Some of their understanding of the original doctrine of the Puritans has changed as a result of compromises. 787 AD, the Valdenses Paterines, the ancient early Christians that followed the teachings of Christ and the writings of the apostles were dispersed to many regions and countries, but during times of intense persecution, the ones that survived the best were those in geographically protected areas, like the valleys of Piedmont. The valleys of Piedmont were also nicknamed the Israel of the Alps. It should also be mentioned that there are multiple spellings for most of the locations and groups mentioned in this session, so don't let that confuse you. 794 AD, the ancient Jews and Gentiles who followed the ancient doctrines of the patriarchs and the prophets and of Christ and the apostles, were often persecuted by those who aligned themselves with the state-approved religions. Roman Emperor Charles the Great, also known as Charlemagne, and Claudius, Archbishop of Turin, of the Waldensian Valleys of Piedmont, held a meeting called the Frankfurt Council with Roman Pope Adrian in an attempt to convince the Church of Rome to embrace the true doctrines of Christ and his apostles, but were unsuccessful. 817 AD, the valleys of Piedmont were inhabited by the Valdenzas. Many Valdenzas related by blood still live there today, but now they go by the name of Waldenzas. The Archbishop of Turin, Claudius, who lived not far from the valleys of Piedmont, maintained a strong vehement stance against idol worship. 1040 AD, the Paterines. The Paterines were named after Pataria which is a place near Milan, Italy. They held communion with the Bishop of Milan, and together they sided against the Roman Pontiff Nicholas II. Although Voltaire was against Christians, he speaks of the Paterines, calling them the Piedmontese in his general history, and saying that they were very numerous at Milan. 1159 AD, the people of the Piedmont Valleys finally came to settle into their permanent name, Waldenses. The torchbearers elsewhere, however, were called by other names. They were called Paulicians by some, after the Apostle Paul who taught them in those regions. In England they were called Puritans for their commitment to holy purity, and they had also existed there since the time of the Apostles. They were branded with hot irons and burned alive by the state-run Roman Church of England, but the persecution only increased interest creating an ever-growing number of strong believers. As a reminder, much of what has been written about the history and beliefs of these early torchbearer Christian groups on the internet is inaccurate, and instead the enemies of the torchbearer groups have slanderously attributed false beliefs and history to them, 
and at times their enemies have linked real heretical groups to the torchbearers by calling both groups by the same names, which has been repeatedly documented by biblical researchers from the 1500s and the 1600s. 1179 to 1181 AD, Pope Alexander III, in 1179 AD, sanctioned a crusade against people Rome termed heretics in the south of France and elsewhere. These people were known as Cathari, or Pure Ones, Paterinines, Albigenses, and others. In 1181 AD, Pope Lucius III made a decree against the torchbearers, calling them Catharists, Josephists, and heretics. In modern times, many who attempt to research the Waldenses are led to believe that the Waldensian churches were started by Peter Waldo, but this can be disproven. Waldensian churches existed long before Peter Waldo, who lived during 1140 to 1205 AD. This was confirmed by Gretzer, a Roman Jesuit in 1178 AD. It was the Roman papacy that started the myth that Peter Waldo started these churches. Enemies of the Waldensians agree that the Waldensian church history extends to apostolic times, per Rhaenyras Sacho, a papal inquisitor of the 13th century AD, who was formerly known as a Vados minister, otherwise known as a Waldensian minister. 1215 AD, at the 12th Ecumenical Council, Pope Innocent III and 400 bishops enacted a decree to exterminate anyone perceived as heretics. This triggered new crusades against all who did not recognize the power of the Roman Pope. This decree was directed towards the torchbearers, the Jews, and against all those who occupied the Holy Land. 1259 AD, the 500 Vados in the Paterine Church of Albi, France, were called Albigenses. There were over 1,500 members in Concorezzo and 200 in Bagnolo. 1322 AD, according to a contemporary historian, half of England had become Lollards, who followed many Waldensian beliefs. The Lollards also followed John Wycliffe, a Reform Roman Catholic priest. There is documented evidence that on August 14, 1533, at least one torchbearer group, the Dauphiny, abstracted, in other words, took, quote, several ancient manuscripts and papers concerning the history of the Vados, of which they took possession before they went away, end quote. From the area of the Piedmont Valley, Returning to their homeland in southeastern France in order to protect the information, some say they did not become a state of the Roman Empire until the 11th century. June 3, 1535 A.D., a French Bible was translated by Pierre Robert Oliftan, John Calvin's cousin, from the Waldenses' pure Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. This cost of the Vados 1,500 golden crowns to have printed as a gift to the reformers. Evidence is provided within the supplemental lecture notes reference area for this session that the pure Hebrew and Greek manuscripts were preserved and passed down from the time of Christ and the apostles to 1535 A.D., some going so far as to even refer to the pure text as, quote, original text, end quote as described in the book called The Israel of the Elves, on page 97. Olive Tan admitted that he was not the best qualified to do the translation, and he was only one man, but the Olive Tan Bible had a marked impact. Shortly after completing the translation, Olive Tan was poisoned and killed by the Roman Papal Inquisition in Rome. The famous reformer John Calvin updated the Bible in 1540 to 1560 AD and became known as the French and English Sword Bible, otherwise known as the Geneva Bible. The torchbearers' enemies had always attempted to tie the torchbearer groups in with actual heretics and even called the torchbearers by actual heretical names, but by now their adversaries were getting desperate. They started a lie too large to be believed by Philip the Seventh, Duke of Savoy, and upon hearing it, the Duke, quote, desired to see the Vados children, 
it having been reported among the vulgar that the vados children were born with one eye in the midst of their forehead and four rows of black teeth end quote. 1559 and 1560 a d the known authentic records proving the antiquity of the waldensian churches were committed to flames by the roman persecutors who had spent two years industriously seeking them out this was an attempt to silence the Waldensian torchbearer history of the ancient manuscripts. 1588 A.D. The Sword Bible was revised by a famous French reformer, Theodore Beza, who was a disciple of John Calvin and lived most of his life in Geneva, Switzerland. This newly revised Bible became known as the Revised French Geneva Bible. Beza also issued a Greek New Testament in 1598 A.D. Although this was an improvement, he was still just one translator. 1611 A.D. The King James Bible is finished. There are several misunderstandings about the King James Bible. First, it was not written by King James, nor did he choose what text would be included or not included in it the king james bible was translated by six groups comprised of forty-seven of the world's best translators there is often confusion on how many translators were involved because king james appointed fifty-four quote, but the number actually employed upon it in the first instance was forty-seven end quote, as described in the book called the translators revived the king james translators lived and breathed the desire to follow god above all else and were trained from birth on multiple languages besides english for example the translator john boyce quote, at the age of five years he had read the bible in hebrew by the time he was six years old he not only wrote hebrew legibly but in a fair and elegant character end quote another example is lancelot andrews who during his school vacation time quote, would find a master from whom he learned some language to which he was before a stranger in this way after a few years he acquired most of the modern languages of europe and a brave old chronicler remarks that such was a skill in all languages especially the oriental meaning eastern languages that had he been present at the confusion of tongues at babel he might have served as interpreter general in his funeral sermon by dr buckridge bishop of rochester it is said that dr andrews was conversant with fifteen languages end quote. the following quote which will be read with the bracketed information is from the book called translating the new testament epistles sixteen o three through sixteen eleven a manuscript from the king james westminster company edited by ward allen which discusses how part of the translation was conducted by stating quote, at various times king james's translators paused to scrutinize their revision of the bishop's bible which was their starting point for a new version once a week translators assembled in companies or groups to discuss the portion which during the preceding week each had amended when a company finished revision of a book of the bible the members of all the other companies scrutinized that revision after a company had finished its entire assignment its work was circulated among learned men of the kingdom of england this circulation done each company once more took its work to the anvil finally at a general meeting in london translators selected from all the companies reviewed the completed work and prepared a text for the printer End quote. there are many more translation rules as well as details about the individual translators which we will not be covering here for more information you can read the book translators revived by alexander wilson mcclure published in new york by charles scribner in 1853 at the time of this writing it is available to be downloaded for free from archive.org many older bibles texts and manuscripts were consulted by the translator teams even from their own privately held collections however depending on who you ask 
modern scholars may tell you conflicting accounts of which primary base text was used to create the king james bible this is because none of the source text that still exists today is a hundred percent match and for good reason the waldenses pure hebrew and greek text which is now missing was likely the primary source text but they used the bishop's bible as their starting point although not required there is additional evidence of the text purity the oldest new testament text the jesus papyrus also known as the magdalen college papyrus p sixty four authored by matthew is dated to before sixty a d by professor karsten peter tida and doesn't match the text of the bibles translated after eighteen eighty one which used the new westcott and hort text which the nestle Allen and u b s greek text books also use but the jesus papyrus does match the text of matthew contained within the king james bible see the supplemental lecture notes for additional details we have evidence that the translators were familiar with the various torchbearer groups and were torchbearers themselves for example translator george abbott archbishop of canterbury spoke at length of the wycliffs dulcinus lioness waldenses albigenses and others and is listed in the churchmen volume sixty two as a puritan besides existing documents showing that the translators had knowledge of the different torchbearer groups and at least one of them being a torchbearer we have documented evidence that pierre robert oliftan a cousin to the famous reformer john calvin had a copy of the pure hebrew and greek text that the waldenses preserved from the time of the apostles we also have some notes of the king james bible translators like john boyce's thirty-nine pages of handwritten translation notes john boyce and others provide hints that they had and used torchbearer manuscripts calculations have been conducted for how often the translations are attributed to quote, some source other than the bibles listed end quote, to create the king james bible versus how often the word choices in manuscript ninety eight are attributed to text from the quote, bibles listed end quote. the bibles listed refers to the older tyndale bible the great bible cloverdale the geneva new testament fifteen fifty seven whittingham the geneva bible fifteen sixty the reims new testament the bishop's bible and the king james bible translation notes written into the margins of one of the bishop's bibles here we see an example of the king james bible translation notes written into the margin of one of the bishop's bibles interestingly the other sources or source was used approximately forty per cent of the time in the translation work to create the authorized king james version of sixteen eleven this conclusion is based upon the analysis of manuscript ninety eight which is the name given to a collection of pages of translation notes for the new testament from the king james westminster company keep in mind that the translators were never told to use the reims new testament listed in the image it should also be pointed out that many assume that the translators used old bibles as their primary resource to create the authorized king james bible because of their fourteenth translation rule quote, directed them to use in addition to the bishop's bible the tyndale matthew cloverdale whitchurch and the geneva end quote this is however assuming they didn't have the pure hebrew and greek text from various torchbearer groups and we already know that the pierre robert oliftan bible used the pure hebrew and greek text from the waldenses to create a french bible which later became the geneva bible see the page briefing called translating the kjv new testament the other manuscripts from the torchbearerseries.com website for additional details we should also not forget as previously mentioned the strong evidence that the apostle paul and other first century followers of christ traveled to england and ireland who would have left pure documents behind as well as the correct understanding of the manuscripts to then be handed down from one generation to another
the previous information reinforces what the king james translators said themselves on the sixth page of the authorized king james bible of sixteen eleven which states their translation was quote, out of the original sacred tongues end quote. some have believed that there have been many translation revisions to the king james bible ever since sixteen eleven but this is not true the corrections made soon after the first 1611 print run were not a result of mistranslations, but as a result of printing press problems. Quote, Some errors of the press having crept into the first edition and others into later reprints, King Charles I, in 1638, had another edition printed at Cambridge, which was revised by dr samuel ward and mr john boyce two of the original translators who still survived assisted by dr thomas goad mr mead and other learned men End quote. evidence demonstrates that the modern authorized king james bibles are an accurate transmission of the king james translators text of sixteen eleven this includes the authorized king james version of sixteen eleven minus the original printing errors and word spelling changes which have been determined by carefully conducted linguistic comparisons even the american bible society abs for short had the following to say quote, the english bible as left by the translators has come down to us unaltered in respect to its text except in the changes of orthography which the whole english language has undergone to which the version has naturally and properly been conformed End quote. this prompts the question who's the best publisher of the kjv bible there appears to be near universal agreement that the cambridge type is best which avoids a few minor printing mistakes that the oxford publisher had the oxford university error wrongly put sins for sin second chronicles thirty three nineteen and whom he instead of the correct whom ye jeremiah thirty four sixteen the cambridge university press did not make these printing errors as a side note all of the thomas nelson bibles we've checked get the first one correct and the second one wrong so the thomas nelson bibles seem to be a bit of a mix between the oxford and the cambridge type please see the supplemental lecture notes or the torchbearerseries dot com website for more information on obtaining a free version of the cambridge type authorized king james bible as well as good publishing companies to purchase printed versions from over the last four hundred years the b raid system of correcting manuscripts appears to have been adapted and employed in discovering preventing and correcting printing press errors for the authorized king james version of the bible which is still used to prevent errors today these minor mistakes made by men provide valuable insight into the free will god allows us to have yet at the same time still allow for god's total sovereign goal to be accomplished a biblical example of this is when moses disobeyed and struck a rock a second time when he was instructed by god to speak to the rock to obtain water if moses had followed god's instructions it would have represented christ's second coming see numbers twenty eleven and deuteronomy thirty two verses five through fifty two at times portions of the bible have been misunderstood or hidden to man as is in the case during king josiah's reign second kings chapter twenty two verse eight reads quote, and hilkiah the high priest said unto shaphan the scribe i have found the book of the law in the house of the lord and hilkiah gave the book to shaphan and he read it End quote. but it is never lost to god quote, it is the glory of god to conceal a thing but the honor of kings is to search out a matter End quote. proverbs twenty five two doubts about biblical preservation inspiration interpretation authority doctrine and truth can be mended by diligent research prayerful study trust in god and faith the size of a mustard seed see matthew seventeen twenty do not let the small things erode your faith 
when you know that the foundational rock for your faith is true, which is the literal birth, death, and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. See 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. Many have also wrongly believed that using these and thous in similar language in the King James Bible clouds the translational meaning and only existed culturally during the King James time period. Therefore, it should be done away with due to its outdated and archaic nature. In actuality, the these and thous, as well as other words, were not in use during the time the 47 translators started their work in 1604 to translate the King James Bible. The KJV translators collectively decided to use the these and thous and other words even though no one used them anymore because it contributed to better translational accuracy and clarity of understanding. See the references for additional details. A cheat sheet for these these and thous is Thee, thou, thy, thine is singular. You, ye, your, yours is plural. The Biblical Greek and Hebrew maintain a clear distinction between singular and plural personal pronouns and adjectives, as does the English used in the King James Bible. Several people have pointed out an interesting observation. And although it is interesting, we do not think it should be regarded as a reason for choosing to use the King James Bible. We read in Psalm 12:6, quote, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, end quote. As some have pointed out, there are seven complete English Bibles up to and including the King James Bible. This is not specific to the King James Bible, but we will touch on it here. There have been many supposed Bible contradictions that have been published on the internet, the vast majority of which can be easily explained, even by a small amount of research. For example, within just one website there are over 101 supposed contradictions that are thoroughly resolved. We have now completed going over the rightmost column the torchbearer lineage, and have learned of an unbroken manuscript chain of custody, also known as umcoke, for the text of the Bible. This lineage has existed outside of the Roman Catholic and later Protestant lineages. We have also learned the following. First, testimony from twelve biblical writers that Christianity was brought to Britain in the first century by at least one of the twelve apostles. Second, Testimony from two royal families that Christianity was also delivered to Britain in 57 AD and into Ireland and Gaul, and also the first British torchbearer church was established around 177 AD. Third, the high likelihood of Christianity being brought into both India and Africa in the first century. Number four. By the second century, Christianity had spread to all over Europe. Number five, the ancient torchbearers were neither Protestant nor Roman Catholic, for neither existed at this early time. Number six, a Roman emperor as well as a Waldensian torchbearer archbishop tried to convince the Church of Rome to embrace the true doctrines of Christ and his apostles, but failed. Number seven, Roman persecutors admitted to the torchbearers ancient ties to the apostles. Number eight, Roman popes started exterminating anyone who did not recognize the absolute power of the pope, including Jews and torchbearers. Number nine, the torchbearers of the Israel of the Alps preserved the true Hebrew and Greek text and provided a translated French copy to the Roman Catholic reformers as a gift. Number 10. Half of England had become Lollards, who followed many beliefs of the Waldenses and Roman reformer John Wycliffe. Number 11. The Pierre Robert Olivetan Bible, John Calvin Bible, Theodore Beza Bible, and the 47 translators of the King James Bible all used pure texts obtained from the various torchbearer groups. And number 12, at least some of the King James Bible translators were torchbearers themselves, 
who created the ultimate English translation of the Bible. This is just part of the amazing history of how we obtain God's preserved words in English. We will continue working our way from right to left. The next column from the torchbearers is the influencers, those who have influenced the Roman lineage stream or the torchbearer lineage stream. As you will see for yourself, each of these primary lineage streams and influence streams has a direct effect on today's Christianity and even how the Bible doctrines or beliefs are interpreted and understood today. It might also be useful to point out that the color of the subsections correspond to the colors within the full lineage chart. So in section 2, the subsection titles will be changing from blue to black. 314 AD, Sylvester I joined the Romesh Church and became the first documented pope. But it has been called into question whether he was indeed the first pope, since the primary document used as evidence for this is now widely regarded as a forgery. A Roman Catholic Jesuit priest, Robert Parsons in 1604, wrote in his book that the Waldenses, quote, affirmed that from the time of Pope Sylvester downward, the Roman Church had erred, end quote. As a side note, in a book on the history of the Waldenses, it states that they had previously been called Lioness, who were previously called Paterines, but some have said that they are also separate groups having mostly shared beliefs. 590 AD, nine bishops reject communion of the Pope as heretical. Until 869 AD, all ecumenical councils had been held in or near Constantinople and in the Greek language, not Latin. This is because the power of the church had tended to lean towards the eastern end of the Mediterranean, where today's modern-day Turkey and the western part of Syria resides, not Rome, Italy. It wasn't until after 869 AD that the ecumenical councils were held in Latin, the language of Roman imperialism. 1369-1415 AD John Huss was formerly of the Roman Catholic priesthood turned reformer and tried to reform the Roman Church. He was a hero to Martin Luther and other reformers. John Huss and his followers embraced some ideas and opinions from the Wycliffs, Dulcinus, Lionus, Waldenses, Albigenses, and others. The Roman Church reformers became reformers after their interaction with diverse torchbearer groups who collectively held the correct doctrines and preserved the pure Hebrew and Greek manuscripts handed down from the apostles. See the additional references for more examples of reformers embracing the ideas and beliefs of the torchbearers. 1466 to 1536 A.D. Desiderius Erasmus. He was a member of the Roman Catholic priesthood who appeared to make an attempt to reform the Roman Church from within, but wasn't successful. Erasmus created a Greek New Testament text in 1522 A.D and although he seems to have held a neutral stance between the reformers and Rome, he did not always remain neutral, such as his belief in transubstantiation, which is the Roman Church's belief that the real body and blood of Lord Jesus Christ are literally present in the bread and wine, which is still held by the Roman Church at the time of this writing. 1483 to 1546 AD, Martin Luther was a former Roman Catholic priest who became one of the well-known reformers and also attempted to reform the Roman Church. He created a German Bible between 1522 and 1534 AD. Although Luther started out in defense of the Jewish people, he soon became disenfranchised with the Jewish rejection of Jesus, their long-awaited Messiah, and he fell back into old teachings. We will skip the additional details for now, but we will pick this back up later on in this session. 1526 AD Waldensian meetings began to be held to discuss the Reformation. The first documented meeting occurred in 1526 AD 
when a pastor from angronia northwestern italy in a region of piedmont named ganon brought back the publications of luther from germany triggering several conferences to be held to discuss if the reformers were in alignment with their core beliefs or not on september twelfth fifteen thirty two a d the Vado senate was held where the reformers met with the waldenses and the waldenses provided a pure apostolic bible to the reformers one of the reformers present at the meeting was quoted as saying they quote, greatly rejoiced to see that people who had ever proved faithful that israel of the alps to whose charge god had committed for so many centuries the ark of the new covenant thus eager in his service end quote. and continuing quote, correctly copied with the hand at a date beyond all memory they marveled at that favor of heaven which a people so small in numbers had enjoyed and rendered thanks to the lord that the bible had never been taken from them End quote. 1509 to 1564 a d john calvin a roman catholic who later became a reformer calvin's cousin pierre robert oliftan met with the waldenses in 1532 to 1535 a d and translated the pure hebrew and greek which had been protected and handed down from one generation to the next from father to son into the french oliftan bible the following was written in the preface of the french oliftan bible by pierre robert oliftan about his translation of the bible published on june third fifteen thirty five Quote, I present this precious treasure, whereof thou mayest say is the children of Israel, yet hoping that it shall never create thee any trouble, in the name of a certain poor people, thy friends and brethren in Jesus Christ, who ever since they were blessed and enriched therewith by the apostles and ambassadors of Christ, have still enjoyed and possessed the same and being now willing to gratify thee with what thou desirest so earnestly they have given me a commission to draw this precious treasure out of the hebrew and greek cabinets and having wrapped up the same in a french mantle to the best of my skill and according to that talent which the lord hath given me forthwith to present thee with it o poor church on whom no man bestows anything End quote the full text is much longer but this will at least give you a better idea of what was written thus we have an unbroken manuscript chain of custody from the apostles to the time of the reformers which is also stated in the book called the israel of the alps Quote, thus was the primitive church preserved in the alps to the very period of the reformation the vados are the chain which unites the reformed churches with the first disciples of our saviour it is in vain that popery renegade from evangelical verities has a thousand times sought to break this chain it resists all her efforts empires have crumbled dynasties have fallen but this chain of scriptural testimony has not been broken because its strength is not from men but from god End quote. Starting at least in the 1500s as a result of interacting with some of the reformers of the Church of Rome, and some tiring of the repeated persecution, the Waldenses began compromising their heritage of true doctrine and theology for the sake of unity. This did not change the text of their Bible, but it affected their understanding of it and the high holy standards they once held a modern waldensian pastor named esteban janivel who is a direct descendant of a famous janivel see the image on the left is seeking to restore and maintain the true pure holiness of the waldensian apostolic doctrine in summary we have seen both positive and negative effects upon the torchbearer lineage stream on the positive we have individuals who embrace the truth carried by dozens of torchbearer groups composed of millions of diverse people on the negative many gave up several of the true doctrinal beliefs that had been passed down from the apostles so they could join the growing roman reformers 
This decision was not unanimous, however, since, quote, a number dissented, end quote, including two pastors who refused to sign and withdrew from the synod. This was, quote, the first schism which ever broke out in the Vados church. It must be observed, however, that the two dissenting pastors did not belong to the valleys but to Dolphiny, end quote. This is in reference to yet another torchbearer group. The merger of multiple torchbearer groups with the reformers effectively created a third group, whose name and movement never having existed before the 16th century. They were known as the Protestants, with the name meaning those that protest, which refers to those that protest the authority of the Roman Pope. We will now go through the center column called Roman Religion and Empire. 313 A.D., Edict of Milan, Christianity is made legal by Emperor Constantine I after his claimed vision in the sky. This had both positive and negative effects. Prior to this edict, the official Roman religion had been one of paganism with pagan priests. An example of this was Mithraism, the practice of worshipping the sun, and remained so even after the edict. The Edict of Milan made it so the torchbearer Christians would no longer be persecuted by the Roman Empire. This lack of persecution was clearly positive, but it also meant many would become Christian and risk nothing by doing so, creating a lack of motivation to either commit to being fully in or out, resulting in many nominal Christians. 321 A.D. Emperor Constantine I makes Sunday the day of rest for worshipping the sun god Apollo. Pagan Christian coins are also then minted long after Constantine's supposed conversion. The additional information next to the coins has been dropped so that you can see the coins more clearly. We find numerous revealing details in a book published in the 1900s called Lectures on the History of the Eastern Church by Arthur Stanley, in which it states, quote, His coins bore on the one side the letters of the name of Christ, on the other the figure of the sun god, and the inscription, Sol Invictus, as if he could not bear to relinquish the patronage of the bright luminary which represented to him, as to Augustus and to Julian, his own guardian deity, end quote. It then goes on to say, quote, The retention of the old pagan name of De Solis, or Sunday, for the weekly Christian festival is, in great measure, owing to the union of pagan and Christian sentiment, with which the first day of the week was recommended by Constantine to his subjects, pagan and Christian alike, as the venerable day of the sun. His decree, regulating its observance, has been justly called a new era in the history of the Lord's Day. It was his mode of harmonizing the discordant religions of the empire under one common institution. End quote. These were just two of the many examples of Constantine enacting his plan, which was to unify his diverse empire within one new state approved religious belief system in order to maintain and obtain more control over the population. 325 A.D. Council of Nicaea Constantine continues to push for merging Christianity with other religions of the pagan Roman Empire by declaring Sunday as the day for the celebration of the pagan Christian Astarte Easter, also known by other pagan names. There are dozens of old and rare books published on this subject, but let's go through just a small sampling by reading a portion of A History of the Christian Councils from the Original Documents, Volume 1 by Carl Joseph, published in 1894, where Constantine I addresses the Council. Quote, we give you good news of the unity which has been established respecting the holy Passover. All the brethren in the East who formerly celebrated Easter with the Jews will henceforth keep it at the same time as the Romans with us, and with all those who from ancient times have celebrated the feast at the same time with us. End quote. As a reminder again, 
This and other scanned images from old rare books is available for free in high resolution in the supplemental lecture notes by going to www.thetorchbearerseries.com. This image is also available within the lineage chart called Chart of New Testament Lineage Streams Unbroken Chain of Custody. Continuing, quote, It was declared to be particularly unworthy for this, the holiest of all festivals, to follow the custom, the calculation, of the Jews, who had soiled their hands with the most fearful of crimes, and whose minds were blinded. End quote. Constantine must have forgotten that Jesus was born to a Jewish family, and most of the apostles and early followers of Jesus were Jewish, and it was Jewish people who wrote most of the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. Constantine continues, quote, In rejecting their custom, we may transmit to our descendants the legitimate mode of celebrating Easter. We ought not therefore to have anything in common with the Jews. End quote. By association, all seven festivals of Israel of the Jewish Christians are to no longer be observed, according to Constantine. Note that Hanukkah is not one of the seven festivals of Israel but it was implied to be observed during the times of Jesus. See John 10.22. The seven most important Jewish Christian holy days are Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles. If we are to understand how some of the current doctrines have gone astray, it is of paramount importance to understand the catalyst, original cause, so we will continue with this a little further. Rome was the catalyst for Roman Christians distancing themselves from the Jewish people, festivals, and customs which was and is against the beliefs of the torchbearers. The torchbearers have always followed the true Passover on the fourteenth day of the Jewish month of Nisan and then celebrated Christ's Resurrection Day on first fruits, not a start of Easter. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, quote, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. End quote. Constantine continues, quote, To separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews, for it is truly shameful for us to hear them boast that without their direction we cannot keep this feast. But even if this were not so, it would be your duty not to tarnish your soul by communications with such a wicked people, the Jews. Our Savior has left us only one festival day of our redemption, that is to say, of his holy passion, and he desired to establish only one Catholic church." End quote. Still continuing with Constantine, quote, And every one, I hope, will agree upon this point, as on the one hand, it is our duty not to have anything in common with the murderers of our Lord. We should have nothing in common with the Jews. Easter should be everywhere celebrated on one and the same day. The Synod requires, first, that Easter Day should always be a Sunday, and therefore decides against the Quattrodecimans and second, that it should never be celebrated at the same time as the Feast of the Jews. It results from this second decision that according to the Synod, if the day should fall on a Sunday, Easter was not to be celebrated on that Sunday, but a week later. End quote. Quattro Decimans is the name given to those who continued to observe Nisan 14 as the true Passover as well as the day Jesus died. There is more information contained within the scanned references, which are included at the end of the chart of the New Testament lineage streams, Unbroken Chain of Custody, but we'll move on. A positive thing that came out of the Council of Nicaea was that Arianism was rightly condemned during the meeting. We will briefly go over Arianism later in this session. Also, as a reminder again, it's not practical to provide all the references in this audio-video lecture, so for a full list of references, please see the free downloadable supplemental lecture notes. 337 AD, 
Pope Julius I creates Christmas. He invents this holiday from the combined pagan Roman festivals of Saturnalia and Sol Invictus, and redesignated them as the Feast of Christ Nativity, Mass on Christ Day, or shortened as Christmas. This was done even, quote, in spite of serious objections, end quote, and others calling it a, quote, questionable innovation, end quote. Most who want to portray Christmas in a less pagan light do so by comparing only the Roman holiday of Sol Invictus, leaving out the closer Roman holiday of Saturnalia. Other traceable ancient pagan holidays were also included, likely in an attempt to better unify, through compromise, the whole empire. This list is a few of the many things that the holidays would involve for the winter festivals of Saturnalia and Sol Invictus. Wild drunken licentiousness, unrestrained merriment, no public business could be transacted, law courts were closed, schools were kept holiday, to commence war was impious, indulgences were granted, presents were interchanged among friends, toys the children, crowds thronged the streets shouting Saturnalia, ornamented trees, a cooked goose, yule cakes, deities worshipped, venerated, or honored, which include Lord of the Fir Tree, Queen of Heaven, Sun God, Helios, Sol, Saturn, Osiris, and more. Please keep in mind that every item on this list has a corresponding reference and high resolution scan on the referenced page within the chart of New Testament Lineage Stream's Unbroken Chain of Custody. The whole month of December was considered a dedication to Saturn. The sun god Apollo was also worshipped and venerated under different names. More information can be found within the definitive book on Saturnalia from 1524 AD shown here. Unfortunately, it is not written in English, but perhaps someone will translate it in the future. The Roman Church, and later the Reformers who used to be part of the Roman Church, still held to many of the traditions, beliefs, and ideologies of Rome. Christmas was never part of the traditions and beliefs of Jesus and the Apostles, and instead, since the time of the Apostles, the torchbearers have observed Hanukkah, not Christmas. To illustrate the pure, unyielding, and uncompromising views held by the various torchbearer groups of the 1600s, as demonstrated by the Puritans during the times shortly after the King James Bible was created, the following information will be presented. On December 24, 1652, the Parliament of England voted and passed the law banning the celebration of Christmas. At the time, the Puritans referred to Christmas Day using the following strong terms, quote, Profane man's ranting day, the superstitious man's idle day, the papist massing day, the old heathen's feasting day, the multitude's idle day, Satan that adversary's working day. End quote. This sentiment was also reflected in America, especially in Massachusetts, when quote, the New Englanders who gave America the traditions of Thanksgiving Day, Thanksgiving Day proclamations, the Mayflower Compact, John Winthrop's City on a Hill, and Election Day sermons, criminalized the celebration of Christmas in sixteen fifty nine and whosoever shall be found observing any such day as Xmas or the like would be fined." End quote. In both of these previous examples, those siding with the traditional Roman beliefs, the Roman Church and many Roman reformers, eventually caused the laws to be reversed in England in 1660, when Charles II reversed all laws from the previous eight years and was reversed in Massachusetts in 1681, against the strong objections of the diverse torchbearer groups at the time. The Puritans, Quakers, and others were also against Christmas, but these were not torchbearers in the strictest sense. They were Protestants, who most of which still held a few flaws in their doctrine from Roman influence. 
the cathari puritans held closer to the true doctrine passed down by the apostles as a side note christmas was not made a national holiday in the united states of america until june twenty eighth eighteen seventy we are now returning back to our roman timeline three sixty three to three sixty four a d the council of laodicea canon twenty nine outlawed the keeping of god's fourth commandment quote, a christian shall not stop work on the sabbath saturday end quote, and reaffirm changing the lord's day from saturday to sunday by redefining the meaning of the lord's day to mean sunday they also reaffirmed an anti-semitism stance following constantine's example against following anything that the jewish people observed including one of the ten commandments that had been written in stone by god's own hand they coined the terms judaize and judaizer and broadly misapplied what saul paul said in galatians two fourteen about requiring non-compelled gentiles to live like the jews the roman council of laodicea canon twenty nine went so far as to say that if quote, any shall be found to be judaizers let them be anathema from christ end quote. anathema meaning banned cursed and damned these stances still influenced and held sway over the future roman church reformers including martin luther and others rome certainly appeared to be maintaining a strong stance against the jewish people which seemed to be counterproductive based upon what god said of the jews in genesis twelve three we read quote, and i will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed end quote. later the ten commandments were redefined by the roman church in some examples they simultaneously condemned and approved of the veneration of idols still held today and changed the order in which the commandments appeared by duplicating a commandment in order to remove one and subtly removed words like the removal of quote, bow down end quote, to images as stated in exodus twenty verses four through five this affected two commandments keeping the sabbath holy the fourth commandment and not committing idolatry the second commandment which both the jews and torchbearers held in high regard three hundred and eighty a d edict of thessalonica the new roman form of pagan christianity was signed in the law as the official roman religion by emperors theodosius and valentinian the second through this edict thus proclaiming rome as the catholic or universal unified religion they also contemplate the use of physical force in the service of orthodoxy for the first time the roman emperor gratian is sometimes left out of the list of those who signed this edict but for the sake of completeness in this lecture we wanted to mention that he was probably also one of the signers of the edict as depicted in the scan page shown here there is a large amount of information we could cover regarding famous and not so famous forgeries but for the sake of time we will only choose a few to discuss here 498 to 514 a.d pope symmachus in the symmachian manuscript forgeries quote, the object of these forgeries was to produce alleged instances from earlier times to support the whole procedure of the adherents of the symmachus and in particular the position that the roman bishop could not be judged by any court composed of other bishops these forgeries are not the first documents to maintain this later tenet End quote. many of these scanned images are difficult to see in this format which is why high resolution scanned images are included as part of the free downloadable document called chart of new testament lineage streams unbroken chain of custody available from the torchbearerseries.com website to the bishop of Passau, quote, some if not all of the forgeries of lorch a series of documents especially the bulls of the popes symmachus eugene the second leo the seventh and agapetus the second 
fabricated to prove that Passau was a continuation of a former archdiocese named Lorch. By these he attempted to obtain from Benedict VI the elevation of Passau to an archdiocese, the re-erection of those dioceses in Pannonia, and Mechia, which had been suffrages of Lorch, and the Pallium for himself, end quote for those who are unaware a bowl in this context is the name given to public decree letters patent or charter issued by a pope of rome seven seventy two through seven ninety five a d pope hadian i the son of a roman nobleman introduced the donation of constantine manuscript forgeries these forgeries were believed to be legitimate for four centuries after being introduced as evidence for the lineage and supremacy of the popes. These forgeries, supported by popes, are still held today by many as evidence for the ecclesiastical supremacy and temporal sovereignty of the popes of Rome. Quote, In 1440, Lorenzo Valla counseled Eugenius IV not to rely upon the donations of constantine which he proved to be spurious false ninth century a d the pseudo isidorian decretals manuscript forgeries these consist of a large collection of nearly one hundred manuscript forgeries which at the time served as a quote, perfect deception end quote to provide support to previous manuscripts and to prove by early authority the absolute power of the pope and of the roman church quote, the secret lay concealed long enough to fortify every branch of ecclesiastical authority to make political rulers tremble and to make rome ready to extend her spiritual sceptre over all rulers end quote it is also worth mentioning that at the time they pretended these were real by acting as if they were miraculously discovered quote, thanks to good fortune they had been discovered end quote. also quote, new research has shown that they used the library of the monastery of corby on the somme to create the forgeries end quote. the roman church has so far admitted that fifty-eight are forgeries 1605 a d the gunpowder plot also known as the jesuit treason this was a well-known plan to blow up england's parliament with barrels of gunpowder underneath in a cellar in order to kill king james i in the parliament to stop the translation of the new english bible among other reasons it has been said of one of the conspirators in the churchman's magazine eighteen forty five sir everard digby Quote, so far was this man deluded by false religion and governed and blinded by the priests of his church that even when preparing for his death being executed as a traitor he wrote to his wife declaring that if he had thought there had been the least sin in the plot he would not have been of it for all the world that no other cause drew him to hazard his fortune in life but zeal to god's religion End quote the eighteen forty five magazine goes on to say to its readers quote, be led to share the full light and blessing of the gospel of peace may be led to inquire into what their church really is not what her priests declare her to be may be led to study the holy scriptures not the popish bible which is translated from false latin copies but the protestant bible translated from the original languages in which its different parts were written let us pray that they may come out from a church which sanctions and commands murder and treason when it can advance her interests and ambitions End quote. the gunpowder plot occurred in sixteen o five with the translation of the king james bible starting in sixteen o four and finishing in sixteen eleven shortly after the sixteen twenties the puritans settled in plymouth massachusetts if you haven't done so already we highly recommend navigating to the page briefings page of the torchbearerseries dot com website and view print or download the free document called codex sinaiticus legitimate or forgery the suspects which includes extensive research research notes for further research 
and numerous old newspaper articles. The document also includes scanned images of the referenced material, enabling quick validation of the facts presented in their original context. Not all references and reference material images will be provided in this audio-video lecture. Around 1859 AD, the Codex Sinaiticus manuscripts loosely form a Greek Bible with a claimed authorship date of 400 AD. It is, however, very likely a professional forgery created by a master forger who has confessed to the crime, but that is up to you to decide after reviewing the evidence presented. It has unfortunately never been chemical tested to determine conclusively whether it is a forgery, which under the conditions it was found and having a known master forger admit involvement is completely against normal protocol and procedure. Nevertheless, it has been used in the translation of most modern Bibles since 1881. Starting in 1881, Westcott and Hort abandoned the traditional text and created a new Greek text, which relied heavily upon newly discovered Codex Sinaiticus, along with previously discovered Vaticanus and Alexandrinus, both containing similar text to the Sinaiticus. Their new Greek text became the Greek Nestle Alland and UBS textbooks used by most Catholic and Protestant translators today. This new text caused translators to doubt God's preserved words and doctrine, resulting in Bibles translated after 1881 to contain thousands of changes from the traditional text, including the removal of Mark chapter 16 verses 9 through 20 and John chapter 7 verse 53 through chapter 8 verse 11. Using the Sinaiticus as an example which already has controversy of being a forgery, let's look at the evidence. We are going to first take a look at the possible means, motive, opportunity, and available other evidence for Dr. Constantine Simonides and Dr. Constantine Tischendorf. We will then look at the dating methods used, forgery testing, evidence of tampering, and other evidence for Codex Sinaiticus. All evidence from old newspaper reports has been obtained from the International Newspaper Repository, newspapers.com, unless otherwise noted. We will start with determining if Dr. Constantine Simonides had the means to forge Codex Sinaiticus. 1. He worked since childhood in a print shop reproducing ancient documents and by the age of 14 was employed as a printing professional. 2. He was highly trained in paleographical methods, ancient Greek, Syriac, Coptic, and more, and was a calligraphist. 3. He was a sought-after expert. 4. He was the head of a university paleographical committee to examine antiquities. 5. He successfully fooled professionals across the world for years with previous fraudulent manuscripts. As a quick side note, it should be mentioned that the formatting to these references are a bit different than the other references in the lecture, which was done intentionally. The references are formatted differently because the references match the exact computer file names for the high-resolution scans of the newspapers. 6. His fraud was only discovered as a result of a chemical ink test being conducted on a document. 7. By the young age of 35, he had made dupes of the most distinguished scholars in the world. We have laid out seven examples of evidence that Dr. Constantine Simonides had the possible means to create professional forgeries. We will now take a look at motive. 1. Money certainly could be a motive. He was arrested for selling forgeries of ancient manuscripts for an extremely high profit, but for some cause was never prosecuted, which was in stark contrast to other forgers who were sentenced to prison and fined. Did he have friends in high places that also would have been implicated in the crime? Even newspaper reports were puzzled why he was never prosecuted. This is something to think about. Two. 
In one case, he demanded the sum of $1 million as reported in the Severance, Kansas newspaper dated November 7, 1890. We will now look at if Dr. Constantine Simonides had opportunity. 1. Dr. Constantine Simonides sold supposed ancient manuscripts to the same Leipzig University where Dr. Constantine Tischendorf worked. Dr. Tischendorf was said to be the discoverer of Codex Sinaiticus, which is still the view widely held by many today. 2. Even when, quote, chemical tests proved that the writing was counterfeit, end quote, and he was, quote, arrested as a forger, end quote, quote, from some cause he was not prosecuted, end quote. 3. He traveled to Constantinople, the same location in which the Emperor of Russia was later to print the copies of Codex Sinaiticus from. 4. Dr. Simonides was said to have died in Alexandria, Egypt, which is near Cairo, Egypt, where the Sinaiticus was edited by Dr. Tischendorf, and where Dr. Tischendorf sent letters from about the Sinaiticus. We have shown evidence for possible means, motive, and opportunity, and will now provide other evidence related to Dr. Constantine Simonides possibly forging the Sinaiticus. 1. He was known to pre-place manuscripts, then notify someone else to make the discovery to distract attention from himself. 2. Dr. Simonides publicly confessed to his involvement in creating Codex Sinaiticus. 3. Dr. Simonides stated he was working to publish proof, while he was in Russia, that he created Codex Sinaiticus. Collectively, the evidence seems to suggest he was part of a forgery team. 4. Before Dr. Simonides could publish his proof, newspapers reported that he died under unusual circumstances and that he died of leprosy in Alexandria, Egypt at age 44 years old, or he died in the country of Albania per a newspaper obituary. We have provided possible evidence for the means, motive, opportunity, and available other evidence for Dr. Constantine Simonides' involvement in creating Codex Sinaiticus, including his confession and the unusual circumstances of his death. We will now take a look at Dr. Constantine Tischendorf's possible involvement, who is the reputed discoverer of Codex Sinaiticus. As before, we will start by determining if Dr. Constantine Tischendorf had the means to be involved with forging Codex Sinaiticus. 1. He worked as a professor verifying ancient manuscripts for Leipzig University, and Dr. Simonides sold forgeries to them. 2. Forged Books of Arrhenius was to go from Dr. Simonides to Leipzig University and then to the King of Prussia. Dr. Tischendorf had once lived in Prussia as a guest. 3. Dr. Tischendorf had strong support from the Pope and the Vatican, as well as strong support from the Emperor of Russia. We will discuss this more shortly. There are many more high-resolution scanned references contained within the document called Codex Sinaiticus Legitimate or Forgery the Suspects, which is freely downloadable from www.thetorchbearerseries.com. We have provided three examples that Dr. Constantine Tischendorf had the possible means to be involved with professional forgeries. We will now take a look at motive. 1. Money, fame, and prestige were all gained by Dr. Tischendorf because of the discovery of Codex Sinaiticus. The accolades and praise of the Protestant Christian Dr. Constantine Tischendorf from the Roman Catholic Pope at the time was shocking and unusual, which did not go unnoticed by the newspapers of the time. The following is a list of positive words in the order in which they are spoken by the Pope in a single letter about Dr. Tischendorf and his crucial discovery. Quote, of great value to scholars of the Catholic persuasion congratulate you, celebrity you, your noble sentiments, illustrious sir, greetings, splendid edition of the Sinaitic Manuscript, illustrious sir, a present, 
so great a work, filled us with admiration, extraordinary zeal, the zeal, so adroitly, enormous labor, extraordinary manuscript, new life, glory you possessed, crowned by this last work. Magnitude, its importance, great part, highly prized, fruits of so many travels, cheerfully, happily executed, advances of Christian knowledge, rich measure, the favor of God, embrace you as a dearest son, bond with us, bonds of perfect love, we beseech of God for you, illustrious sir, we express our gratitude to you, assure you of our high esteem, End quote. At the end of the newspaper article it stated that, quote, the cardinal's hat would be his reward, End quote. To say the Pope heaped praise on Dr. Tischendorf is an understatement. With thirty-five positive things said, some of which were restated more than once, in the Pope's short published letter in the newspaper. 2. The discovery also won Dr. Tischendorf accolades from universities and the Emperor of Russia, who paid for his travels and gave Dr. Tischendorf 100 free copies of Sinaiticus. Keep in mind that Dr. Tischendorf lived in Germany and was a German citizen, not Russian. 3. In a letter, Dr. Tischendorf implies that the discovery of Sinaiticus will cause the importance of the apocryphal books and the Vatican manuscript, Codex Vaticanus, to increase in importance, as well as the Septuagint creating incentive for the Church of Rome to support Dr. Tischendorf and the Sinaiticus. We will now look at if Dr. Constantine Tischendorf had opportunity. 1. Although living in Leipzig, Germany, he was funded and sent by the Emperor of Russia, quote, on a journey of scientific exploration, end quote, to try and discover ancient manuscripts. 2. Dr. Tischendorf was the primary scholar to immediately date the manuscript to the 4th century, along with others that had previously been fooled by forgeries created by Dr. Simonides. Dr. Tischendorf also immediately dated the manuscript before even leaving where he discovered it. We have shown evidence for possible means, motive, and opportunity, and will now provide other evidence related to forging the Sinaiticus. 1. The discovery of the Sinaiticus greatly bolstered the Roman Catholic stance on doctrine and provided more weight to the ignored Roman Catholic Codex Vaticanus. 2. There are conflicting reports on where the Sinaiticus was found, at a convent in Cairo, or at Mount Athos Monastery in Greece, or St. Catherine's in the southern Sinai Peninsula. You might first suspect that the newspapers somehow rushed and got the news reports wrong, but these news reports are not from the same year, and the newspapers reported that this information was obtained from letters that Dr. Constantine Tischendorf wrote himself. 3. Conflicting reports continue from Dr. Tischendorf as to how Codex Sinaiticus was obtained found in a cloth in the steward's room in St. Catherine's at Mount Sinai in the southern Sinai Peninsula, or as a bundle of dusty parchments in St. Catherine's, or in a waste basket as scattered remains in St. Catherine's, or brought by camel to him in Cairo, Egypt. This is four different conditions, plus two completely separate geographical locations. Number 4. Alexander the Second. Emperor of Russia, was of the Russian Eastern Orthodox Catholic Church. The emperor knew Dr. Tischendorf, but did he also know the Pope? We have provided possible evidence for the means, motive, opportunity, and available other evidence for Dr. Tischendorf's involvement in forging Codex Sinaiticus. We will now take a look at the Codex Sinaiticus itself. The dating method used to date the Sinaiticus is called paleographical, meaning someone visually analyzed the handwriting, quality of line, form, spelling, materials used, etc., and dated it based upon its legitimate appearance. At the time of this writing, the codex has never been chemical tested to date the ink, 
which is against normal protocol for a suspected forgery. Dr. Tischendorf made notes and many corrections to copies and, quote, all this put everyone, without seeing the original, in the position to judge of the value and age of the document, end quote. The full Sinaiticus wasn't seen until 2009, when it was scanned and made available online. Is there evidence of tampering? The answer appears to be yes. Some pages appear artificially darkened. See the image and the source of the image for more information. Other issues are also known with the text. Manuscript scholars have said that no less than 14 people have copied and or edited Codex Sinaiticus, and that it appears that Codex Sinaiticus was more of a rough draft. Codex Sinaiticus is said to have had 1. Carelessness in guarding it, 2. Ignorance in copying it, and 3. Error in associating inspired and uninspired records together. The Shepherd of Hermas manuscript created by Dr. Simonides appears to be the same manuscript miraculously found by Dr. Tischendorf, with both men stating that it is 2nd century AD, and later matching the manuscript said to be found with the Sinaiticus. You may not be able to see it within this lower resolution newspaper image shown here, but it mentions two men with the last names of Westcott and Hort, who we will discuss shortly. Much more evidence could have been presented in support of Codex Sinaiticus being a forgery, but we decided to only use 1800s newspaper reports for evidence in this example. There is much more information contained within the research notes section of the last few pages of the free downloadable document called Codex Sinaiticus Legitimate or Forgery the Suspects, as well as better scans of the newspaper references as well. We have really only scratched the surface of this topic, but we have spent enough time to hopefully provide you with enough evidence to decide if Codex Sinaiticus should be trusted. 1881 AD, suspected manuscript forgeries were used in creating altered Greek New Testament text by Westcott and Hort. Evidence from the son of Dr. Brooke Foss Westcott and the son of Dr. Fenton John Anthony Hort suggests that their fathers were very much Gnostics and occultists before, during, and after they worked on creating new Greek New Testament texts. That Greek text is used for new Bible translations today, and that same text was used later by Nestle and Allen's texts, who doubted that the Bible was true. The doubting Nestle Allen text of 1898 AD directly influenced the text used by the United Bible Society of 1946 AD, and has continued up to our present time. We will now go through the free chart called Westcott and Hort, Occultists or Christians, You Decide, which is available from www.thetorchbearerseries.com, page briefing section, and includes information on Dr. Eberhard Nessel and extensive references with scanned images of the referenced pages, enabling quick validation of the facts presented in their original context. Please consider viewing, downloading, or printing the separate Westcott and Hort chart so that you have the high-resolution scanned images of the referenced pages available to review while we go through this lecture. We are going to first take a look at what Dr. Westcott and what Dr. Hort did, their Gnostic or occult memberships, what they believed, and finally why it matters. We will then take a look at Dr. Eberhard Nessel, who used the text from Dr. Tischendorf, Dr. Westcott, and Dr. Hort to create a new Greek New Testament text, which is still used as the basis for most of today's modern translations. Most of this evidence was obtained from Westcott and Hort's sons, who compiled their father's letters into book format. Also, don't let it confuse you that Westcott and Hort both gave their sons the same first name of Arthur. We will start with what Dr. Brooke Foss Westcott did as it pertains to him being an occultist as opposed to being a faithful Christian. 1. 
he conducted seances at the secret Cambridge Apostles Club. 2. He wrote rare occult books with one called Collectanea Hermetica, which is based upon the Alexandrian Egyptian Greek wisdom text of Hermes Trismegistus, and another called A Chemical Kabbalistic Treatise in 1895, which was perhaps originally written under a pen name or had limited distribution, since we have not been able to locate a surviving copy still in existence. 3. He founded the Ghostly Guild, which became SPR, the Society for Psychical Research. 4. SPR worked with the infamous aristocratic Russian-German occultist Madame Helena Blavatsky in 1885. 5. Dr. Westcott is charged with heresy at least three times in 1861, 1865, 1867, and his pamphlet was suppressed after one of the Episcopal referees detected heresy in it. We will now cover his memberships. 1. He was a member of the Cambridge Apostles, a secret club, where they held seances. 2. The Aranus Society was created by Westcott and was made up of senior apostle members. 3. He founded the Ghostly Guild with the goal to, quote, collect and classify authenticated instances of what are now called psychical phenomenon, end quote. Another quote says that the Ghostly Guild was, quote, established for the investigations of all supernatural appearances and effects, end quote, and, quote, Westcott took a leading part in their proceedings, and an inquiry circular was originally drawn up by him, end quote, called the, quote, ghostly circular, end quote, and it goes on to imply that they had spiritual communication through seances. Quote, I, Westcott, had a note from Gordon the other day, and he tells me that he has an admirably authenticated communication, end quote. Number 4. Ghostly Guild becomes SPR, the Society for Psychical Research, which we have already briefly spoken about. The Ghostly Guild was only meant to be, quote, our own temporary name, end quote, per Westcott. 5. The Cock and Bull Club is what outsiders called the Ghostly Guild Club. 6. The original name for the Hermes Club was the Philological Society. Not much is known about the group, but it appears that they discuss Greek and Roman philosophy. We will now go through what Dr. Westcott believes. 1. He followed the Eleatic school of philosophy, Greek philosophy, as did many of the early Gnostics. 2. Beyond naming a club after Hermes, he also specifically mentions Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes Trismegistus is well read by occultists even in modern times. 3. The Hermes Trismegistus texts are the basis for many occult secret societies such as the Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, Theosophy, and Thelema, which are all against Christianity. Both Westcott and Hort appear to have in-depth knowledge of Freemasonry, since the structural inner workings of the, quote, female Freemasonry, end quote, organization are compared to, quote, the guild, end quote, that Westcott and Hort are involved with managing. 4. At 63 years old, in 1888, after the new Greek text was completed in 1881, Westcott is still very much involved with the occult, stating, quote, If I had the command of ghosts just at present, I think that Bismarck's sleep would be a good deal disturbed. Perhaps it is well that I haven't. End quote. Please keep in mind that we are not talking about something someone did before they became a Christian and later changed, or a dumb thing someone did while they were in college. Nor are we talking about someone who only wrote a Bible commentary or taught some classes. We are talking about a group of men who created a new Greek text that continues to influence the translation of most newly translated Bibles. We will now go through why it matters. 
1. Beliefs affect how people think, teach, and translate the Bible, as expressed in the following, quote, The outside world was wont to regard him, Westcott, as a mystic, and the mystical, or sacramental, view of life enters, it is true, very largely into his teaching, end quote. In other words, his thoughts on things deeply impacted what he taught. 2. Would you want someone who swore a membership oath to secret, evil, socialistic clubs which opposes God's leadership role translating God's divinely inspired book? Hort states, quote, Strange, mysterious incidents, much connected with the Rosicrucians, Freemasons, and Invisibles, a sort of outer court, communism being the grand secret and the object of all, end quote. Although this quote is from Hort, much of what applies to Hort also applies to Westcott and vice versa, since they are both in the same clubs and are the best of friends. 3. Westcott and Hort's friend, Maurice, brings up the topic of socialism and asks Hort to read his, quote, letter in the Christian Socialist, end quote. Hort also recounts a warning about joining a secret club, which would have equally applied to Westcott. Quote, him, meaning Maurice, to advise me to stand aloof from them, believe there must be evil attaching to every exclusive society, the counteracting good in this he had found very great. Could there be a more beautiful or delicate recommendation? So I joined. End quote. We will now go through what Dr. Fenton John Anthony Hort did as it pertains to him being an occultist as opposed to being a faithful Christian. Since there is overlap between Westcott and Hort, it will be quicker this time through. 1. He attended seances to summon and stir up creatures and uses New Age occult terminology in a letter he wrote to his wife according to his son Arthur. Quote, we tried the turntables, but the creatures wouldn't stir. End quote. 2. Not only did he attend seances held by other people, but he also conducted seances himself at the secret Cambridge Apostles Club and elsewhere. Rather than going through all of Dr. Hort's Gnostic and occult memberships, which overlap with his closest friend, Dr. Westcott, we will instead summarize by providing a list of the clubs. Number one, the Cambridge Apostles, a secret club. Number two, Aranus Society, senior apostles. Number three, he founded the Ghostly Guild. Number four, Ghostly Guild becomes SPR. Number five, Cock and Bull Club, also known as the Ghostly Guild. Number six, Hermes Club a philological society. There are many corresponding references for their Gnostic and occult memberships, some of which are listed here, but for a full list with scans of the pages, please see the chart called Westcott and Hort Occultists or Christians, You Decide. You may also want to consider their possible involvement with the Freemasons, as well as other secretive organizations since their previous comments suggest an in-depth knowledge of the structural inner workings of the female Freemasonry organization as compared to the structural inner workings of their own guild. We will now go through what Hort believed. 1. He held to many Gnostic beliefs. Quote, I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common in their causes and their results. End quote. 2. Hort mocks those who stringently adhere to the Bible as, quote, fanaticism of the bibliolaters, end quote. 3. In a single page, Hort says, quote, having read so little Greek New Testament and dragged on with the villainous Textus Receptus, the traditional Greek text used for centuries, end quote. He then continues, quote, Think of that vile Textus Receptus leaning entirely on late manuscripts. It is a blessing there are such early ones, end quote. Referring to Codex Sinaiticus that Tischendorf allegedly found. After he mentions Tischendorf by name, 
He then speaks of starting a society to investigate ghosts, the ghostly guild. As previously demonstrated in the chart called Codex Sinaticus Legitimate or Forgery, the Suspects, there are ample reasons to doubt the authenticity of Codex Sinaticus, including the motives of Dr. Tischendorf, who immediately proclaimed its authenticity and age while still out in the field, and an infamous, world-renowned master forger named Constantine Simonides confessing to his involvement with forging the Sinaiticus, also pronounced Sinaiticus, or mocked by some by calling it the Sinaiticus. 4. Dr. Hort believed the followers of John Huss, called Hussites, worshipped Satan, yet Hussites were instrumental in trying to reform paganism out of the Roman Catholic Church. John Huss was also a hero to Martin Luther and other Roman reformers. We will now go through why it matters. 1. God warns in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31, quote, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards, to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. End quote. It certainly appears that Hort and Westcott were seeking communication with ghosts, demonic spirits, even calling them creatures. 2. How did this evil seance communication affect their understanding, translation, and creation of new biblical text? And what about their oaths of allegiance to secret clubs and other potential organizations? Lastly, we will go through what Dr. Eberhard Nessel did, as it pertains to him being a faithful Christian. 1. Created the Nessel Aland, the first edition Greek New Testament book to be used by textual critics and translators. The first edition was published by Eberhard Nessel in 1898, which combined the readings of editions from Tischendorf, Westcott and Hort, and Weymouth, we will not be covering Weymouth in this session for the sake of time. Keep in mind as we go through this, you cannot understand God's word purely from an academic perspective. That God's supernaturally inspired text can only be spiritually discerned by a believer. Quote, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. End quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 We are not aware of any Gnostic or occult memberships for Dr. Nessel, so we will move on to what he believed. 1. Dr. Nessel appears to deny God can preserve his word to even the first generation copy or print run, let alone to future generations. Quote, Nay, even when the two agree, speaking of the original manuscript and copy, there is still the possibility that what the author wrote and allowed to be printed was not what he thought or intended to be read. End quote. 2. He believes that, quote, their disappearance, meaning the original manuscripts, is readily understood when we consider that the greater portion of the New Testament, namely the epistles, are occasional writings never intended for publication, while others were meant to have only a limited circulation. End quote. Essentially, none of what he just said is true. Was this perhaps a statement out of ignorance by Dr. Nessel, since God said multiple times that he would preserve his words? Please see the references shown here, or download the document called God Preserved His Words, available as a free PDF or JPEG file from www.thetorchbearerseries.com. Is it possible that the disappearance of the original manuscripts over a long time period could be the result of Satan, the god of this world until Jesus returns, and evil people burning all the evidence they could locate? See the document called Satan Rules the World Until Lord Jesus Christ Returns, available for free at the TorchbearerSeries.com website. And now for why it matters. If a Bible doubter translates God's scripture, God's guidance is ignored, and thus not inspired, and thus no longer scripture. Quote, 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. End quote. Second Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. Keep in mind the oldest manuscript available, the Jesus Papyrus, also known as the Magdalen College Papyrus P sixty four, is dated at around sixty A.D and agrees with the King James Bible and Textus Receptus, which is the older traditional Greek text, against the newer Nestle Allen and UBS textbooks. Much more evidence could have been presented in support of Westcott and Hort's connections to the occult and secret societies, but we decided to limit most of our evidence collection to Westcott and Hort's sons in this example, who compiled their father's letters into book format. This hopefully has the benefit of providing more accurate and less contested evidence. We have really only scratched the surface on this topic, but hopefully you have enough evidence to decide if Westcott and Hort should be trusted with the creation of a new Greek text to translate Bibles from or not. Please consider downloading the free document called Codex Sinaiticus Legitimate or Forgery, The Suspects from the TorchbearerSeries.com website and share this information with others. You can also view, share, and repost all three of the core Torchbearer Series lectures. We are going to briefly recap something from the previous session as it is worth repeating and expanding on. Most say that only the autographs, originals, were inspired, but this is a modern concept which was first proposed by a Roman Catholic priest named Richard Simon in 1689 to prove that we need textual criticism. This view was popularized in 1881 by B. B. Warfield and A. A. Hodge and was also held by people like Dr. Constantine Tischendorf, Dr. Brooke Foss Westcott, Dr. Fenton John Anthony Hort, Dr. Eberhard Nessel, Dr. Kurt Allen, as well as by Dr. Eugene Nida. Eugene Nida extended the problem specifically with what is called the dynamic equivalency translation method. Also notice the date 1881 keeps coming up as does the 1800s. The year 1881 is when we believe the official abandonment of the biblical redundant array of independent documents, also known as B-Raid, began, and the unbroken manuscript chain of custody, also known as Umcoke, first started to be largely ignored. 1881 plus AD, the creation of many revised Bibles continues. They are created by those who doubt God preserved his words, and whose footnotes and editing only creates more doubts in the minds of people who use them. These Bibles use the new Nestle Allen and UBS scholarly textbooks, which are based upon a very unstable foundation. Those that utilize these textbooks admit that they do not have 100% of God's preserved word, and also admit that they are incapable of producing a perfect translation. Some of the many doubting Bibles are as follows. The NLT, NIV, CEB, NKGV, ASV, RSV, ESV, JB, LB, TEV, NEB, NASV, GNB, NAB, CEV, NBV, NWT, and the list goes on. The following two Bibles use paraphrase so extensively that they should not be considered for use as a Bible. The Living Bible, known as TLB, and The Message, the Bible in Contemporary Language, also known as MSG. Many of the Bibles listed here also have thousands of words changed and Bible verses removed. We will now summarize what we just learned. 1. 313 AD, Edict of Milan, Christianity is made legal under Emperor Constantine I. Nominal Christianity begins. 2. 321 AD, 
Constantine the first makes Sunday a day of rest to worship sun god Apollo. Pagan Christian coins are minted. 3. 325 A.D. Council of Nicaea. Constantine's replacement of the Jewish Gentile Christian Passover in first fruits with Good Friday in Astarte Easter. By association, all seven festivals of Israel of the Jewish Gentile Christians are no longer to be observed. A starty Easter is to be pushed back by a week when required, so it never falls on the correct Jewish day. Arianism was rightly condemned during the meeting. 4. 337 A.D. Pope Julius I as the pagan festivals of Saturnalia and Sol Invictus redesignated and reinvented as Christmas, the torchbearers continued to observe Hanukkah, not Christmas. Christmas never caught on in England and the United States when they were predominantly torchbearer controlled countries. Christmas was even made illegal in England in 1652 and in Massachusetts in 1659, but was later reversed by those in favor of Romanist traditions. 5. 363-364 AD, Council of Laodicea, Canon 29, outlawed the keeping of God's fourth commandment, which is to keep the Sabbath holy creating anti-Semitic terms of Judaize and Judaizer, designed to shame people from not associating with Jewish people, or with the true Jewish-Christian beliefs of the apostles and the resultant torchbearers, with the Roman Church as well as the Protestant churches saying in agreement they are to be anathema, meaning banned, cursed, and damned. Later, the Roman Church altered, redefined, and reordered the Ten Commandments to further obscure Saturday the Sabbath and idolatry. 6. 380 A.D. Edict of Thessalonica Pagan Christianity was signed into law as the official Roman religion, proclaiming Rome as the Catholic or Universal Unified Religion. 7. 498 A.D. to the 9th century A.D. Rome had created nearly 100 known forgeries, with the Roman Church so far admitting that 58 are forgeries. How many more would be discovered if they were all submitted to forgery testing via non-destructive chemical ink analysis? 8. 1605 A.D. The Gunpowder Plot the plot to blow up England's parliament and halt the creation of the King James Bible. 9. 1859 A.D. Codex Sinaiticus manuscripts were shown in the 1800s as well as today to have evidence of being forgeries, but as of this time, no forgery testing via non-destructive chemical analysis has been conducted. 10. 1881 A.D. Westcott and Hort were shown to be strongly associated with Gnosticism and the occult, and they used at least one manuscript that is very likely a professional forgery to create a new Greek New Testament text to the benefit of the Roman Church. This Greek text would later be updated by Nestle Allen in 1898 AD and then by the United Bible Society, also known as UBS, in 1946 A.D., to be used in the translation of nearly all modern Bibles. Some may not be aware that on March 29, 1994, a joint declaration was signed called Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium in which a large group of leading evangelicals compromised biblical truth in order to get closer with the Roman Church. Many Roman reformers of the past continued to hold on to many of the traditions, beliefs, and ideologies of Rome, not having gone far enough in reforming themselves. The following quote speaks well on this topic. Quote, it's better to be divided in truth than united in heresy. End quote. 11. Modern Time Finally remember that many Bibles translated since 1881 use one or all of the following translational systems. 1. The Westcott and Hort Text. 2. 
Eugene Nida's dynamic equivalency, three, paraphrase, or four, other known forged texts, as an example, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is important to point out that as of October 2018, they are now discovering that Dead Sea Scroll fragments are modern-day forgeries, which casts massive doubt on the reliability of the ISV Bible, which is based upon the Dead Sea Scrolls. Although the forgeries have not included Dead Sea Scroll fragments found prior to 1967, the fragments in question have entered into the mix and those used by scholars as quoted in the Times of Israel. Quote, All information from the presumed scribes is included in numerous scholarly articles, data banks, and dictionaries. Correcting these statistical and contextual fallacies could take generations. End quote. To the best of our knowledge, at the time of this writing, no forgery tests using non-destructive chemical ink analysis have been conducted on the Dead Sea Scroll fragments prior to 1967, and thus we do not know if some or all of the Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts are forgeries. Either way, this would not have any negative impact on older Bible translations, such as the King James Bible. We are down to the last two columns of the chart, in this column called Influencers, those that have influenced the heretical cult stream or Roman stream. You will discover those who have assisted in influencing some of the changes to the original doctrine of the apostles. This altered doctrine has been spreading amongst Bible colleges and universities for a long time, but has dramatically increased since the 1800s and 1900s. This altered doctrine has had a direct impact on what pastors have believed and taught for generations now, and has contributed to the growing lack of clarity and trust in the Holy Scriptures taught today. We will not go through each of these quotes again since we covered them at the beginning of this session, but please take a moment to reflect on their meaning or review them later. 35 AD to 110 AD Ignatius of Antioch promoted God's laws for mankind as being Jewish-only laws that only the Jews needed to follow, thus removing the distinction between God's permanent laws and Jewish local and time period laws. The Jewish local and time period laws were added to by the Jewish Pharisee rabbis as time went on. A short example of one of God's laws for mankind is the fourth commandment. To keep Saturday the Sabbath holy, which was first observed by God in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, followed by Moses in Exodus chapter 16, verses 22 through 23, which is before the Ten Commandments are given. Also see Exodus chapter 16, verses 5 through 45. The fourth commandment was said to be known during Exodus chapter 18, verse 16 including the Tenth Commandment against coveting in Exodus chapter 18, verse 21, then officially given later as the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai verbally in Exodus 20. Then God wrote them in stone with his own finger twice, Exodus 31, 18, 32, 19, 34, 1, and 31, 29. Scripture also says that the Sabbath is still in effect at Lord Jesus Christ's return. See Ezekiel chapter 46 verse 1. This is not meant to be a case study of all the evidence for the Sabbath, or God's laws being perpetually in effect unless God explicitly changes them. In the next and the last of the core lecture sessions, session 3, we will touch on Jesus' clarification on how to observe the Sabbath and how the apostles and torchbearers observed it. Note, Ignatius is said to be the first recorded to use the term Catholic, meaning universal, but exactly when the term was first used to describe Christians has been largely lost to time. 150 AD to 215 AD Titus Flavius Clemens, also known as Clement of Alexandria. He was a follower and great admirer of Plato's Greek philosophical teachings and was Origen's teacher. Clement was brought up in the schools of Alexandria 
for the platonic doctrines were taught and were looked upon as a source of gnosticism this will also equally apply to origin who we will discuss shortly other greek philosophers known at the time include socrates and pythagoras who also developed an unhealthy view of the bible clement of alexandria was the first known to promote allegorization of most scripture which included scripture that described the supernatural actions of god and anything else that clement couldn't understand from a physical naturalistic viewpoint with origin following his teacher's lead for example they regarded the paradise garden of eden and the genesis creation account as allegories representing spiritual virtues which go against other clear teachings in the bible that these are literal historical events this is not to be confused with known identified figures of speech in the bible which include known legitimate metaphors similes parables allegories and more see e w bollinger's work on the subject one sixty a d to two forty a d sextus julius africanus he attended schools in alexandria which were in stark contrast to the schools in antioch he was the first strong promoter of the sethite theory which influenced eusebius origen the early church of rome and many others in the book the fallen angels and the heroes of mythology published in eighteen seventy nine rev john fleming writes quote, the supposition that the sons of god were the sons of seth and the daughters of men in hebrew adam were the daughters of cain to whom great numbers of very beautiful women were born it is supposed has no foundation in scripture nay it is against scripture for seth was not god and cain was not adam end quote. interestingly even those who were prone to allegorizing the supernatural aspects of scripture do not do so in this case for example clement of alexandria is of the belief that sons of god beneha elohim means angelic beings and daughters of men benath adam means daughters of adam which matches the meaning throughout the bible the best evidence is always from the bible itself but it is worth mentioning that philo josephus justin martyr tertullian lactantius and others also agree also speaking of angelic beings commingling with humans many authors of the eighteen hundreds had the following to say Quote, this view was maintained by the ancient jewish synagogue by hellenistic jews at and before the time of our savior's sojourn on earth End quote. another author from the eighteen hundreds stated quote, they are angels is most strongly represented in the old synagogue and church End quote. the view that angelic beings commingled with humans also fits modern u f o abduction reports where the sethite theory does not we will perhaps discuss the sons of god topic in a future page briefing in more detail with additional historical and scriptural evidence but for now let's move on one eighty four a d to two fifty four a d origin adamantius also known as origin of alexandria following the footsteps of his teacher clement of alexandria he too was a strong promoter of the allegorization of most scripture he vainly mixed godliness with the philosophy of plato and applied the greek method of allegorical interpretation to the jewish scriptures origin quote, absolutely abandons the literal sense when he asserts that all passages of scripture have a spiritual sense but that all passages have not a corporeal sense that there is often a spiritual truth under a corporeal falsehood that the scripture has incorporated with history many things which have never happened and that the mind which does not perceive that the scripture relates many events as having really happened which could not have taken place in the manner related must be weak and bounded in its operations origen like clement was deeply affected by his study of greek philosophy and in the end could never shake off the false perception colossians two eight comes to mind quote, 
Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. End quote. Again, keep in mind we are not speaking of the legitimate allegories to be found in the Bible and other forms of figures of speech. For example, Isaiah 28.20 is a legitimate allegory from the Bible. See the supplemental lecture notes for additional details. 337 AD to 842 AD and 337 AD, Bishop Eusebius forbade images and pictures of Christ on the premise. Quote, that no man knoweth the Son but the Father. End quote. Three hundred years later, the worship of images became general practice in Roman controlled churches under the Roman Pope Gregory the Third against the second commandment of the Bible. At the same time, Leo the Third of the Eastern churches resisted and destroyed idols, causing anger in Rome. Those destroying idols were known in Rome as image breakers and Paulicians. In 731 AD, Roman Pope Gregory the Third officially anathematized, denounced, and cursed the iconoclasts, destroyers of images. In 754 AD. 338 bishops met and declared that images of Christ were unlawful. This held until a compromise was made in 842 AD between the Eastern, Greek, Armenian, Coptic, and Roman churches, who all agreed to forbid statues but allowed pictures, leaving only the Paulicians to hold their stance against idols. Starting at 85 AD, replacement theology, supersessionism. Since early times, there are some who, upon blaming the Jews for Lord Jesus Christ's death, wanted to revoke God's promises to the Jews and reassign them to the Gentile church. This encouraged anti-Semitism and a growing lack of knowledge of Jewish cultural understanding that is woven throughout the Old and New Testaments, and of the true nature of God's promises themselves. The following are some of those who followed the replacement theology belief and its effects, but it is not intended to be an exhaustive list. 85 AD to 160 AD, Marcion, said to be, quote, the most dangerous among the Gnostics, represents an extremely anti-Jewish and pseudo-Pauline tendency, and turns the gospel into an abrupt, unnatural, phantom-like appearance. He was excommunicated by his own father, who was a bishop, end quote. Marcion said, quote, the God of the Old Testament is harsh, severe and unmerciful as his law he is finite imperfect angry jehovah of the jews end quote. in another statement about marcion quote, marcion rejected all the books of the old testament and wrestled christ's word in matthew five seventeen into the very opposite declaration quote, i am come not to fulfill the law and the prophets but to destroy them End quote. In his view, Christianity has no connection whatever with the past, whether of the Jewish or the heathen world. End quote. Polycarp, who has been referred to as a direct disciple of John the Apostle, is also known to have strongly disapproved of Marcion's theology. Quote, Polycarp of Smyrna, meeting with Marcion in Rome, and being asked by him, quote, Dost thou know me? End quote. Polycarp answered, quote, I know the firstborn of Satan. End quote. 100 AD to 165 AD, Justin Martyr. In the following statements made by Justin Martyr, he blames all Jews for Lord Jesus Christ's death, which is against Jesus and most of the apostles, who were themselves by birth Jewish. Quote, Circumcision, given as a sign that the Jews might be driven away for their evil deeds done to Christ and the Christians. End quote. Continuing, quote, the Jews sent persons through the whole earth to spread calamities on Christians, for other nations have not inflicted on us Christians and on Christ this wrong to such an extent as you have, who in very deed are the authors of the wicked prejudice against the just one, and us who hold by him, so that you Jews, 
are the cause not only of your own unrighteousness but in fact of that of all other men End quote. again there are far too many scanned pages and references to fit within this audio video lecture series so please visit the torchbearerseries.com to view or download the additional information for free 272 AD to 337 AD, Constantine the First. Rome has continuously oppressed Israel and persecuted the Jews, which has been demonstrated throughout the history of the Roman Empire. The Roman Emperor Constantine the First seized on the opportunity to drive a wedge between the Jewish and Gentile followers of Christ and the traditional Jews and at the same time merged rome's diverse pagan cultures to create a new rome approved universal catholic christianity we have already largely covered emperor constantine's strong suggestion which was more of a command that quote, we ought not therefore to have anything in common with the jews end quote. and we covered that he then proceeded to create new universal pagan christian holidays in each case the romans changed the date of the real holy day and ensured it would never fall upon the correct day even if that meant pushing it back an extra week the following is a summary list of roman empire approved holidays which are anti-jewish anti-christian sunday sun god apollo worship replaces saturday the sabbath the real date changed saturnalia and sol invictus redesignated and reinvented as christmas replaces lord jesus christ's real birthday the real date changed astarte easter replaces first fruits and the resurrection day the real date changed good friday replaces passover of nisan fourteen christ's death the real date changed Please see the supplemental lecture notes for all of the references. All previously held Jewish Christian holy days are banned, outlawed, or shamed by naming the followers of the true holy days Judaizers, using the Bible verse out of context from what it was intended in Galatians 2.14 however this did not stop many of the jews and the torchbearers from trying to preserve the true holy days there appears to be close similarities between the leadership of the roman empire and what daniel seven twenty five describes quote, and he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and a dividing of time End quote. history has a tendency to repeat as do prophetic patterns in the bible displayed is the roman symbol of power which many governments connected with the roman empire still incorporate into the various government and educational institutions and from which the term fascism is derived 1198 a d to 1216 a d pope innocent the third under pope innocent the third the persecution of the jews increased which would later be imitated by future roman leaders and eventually the nazis pope innocent the third in conjunction with multiple roman council meetings enacted the following quote, jews in all christian countries and at all times should wear a dress differing from that of the christians End quote. continuing quote, jews to wear a particular dress therefore it was decreed that from the twelfth year of their age jews were to wear a particular color as a badge of their race the men on their hats and the women on their veils this stigma on the jews was an invention of pope innocent and of the fourth council assembled at rome the pope borrowed the idea of forcing the jews to wear a particular badge from the fanatical mohammedans islamic followers this barbarous treatment of the jews pope innocent the third now imitated and their greatest humiliation during six centuries of european life dates from november thirtieth twelve fifteen still continuing quote, 
exclusion of the jews from all honors and offices the jew badge square or round in form of saffron yellow or some other color on the hat or on the mantle was an invitation to the gammon to insult the wearers and to besplatter them with mud it was a suggestion to stupid mobs to fall on them to maltreat and even kill them and it afforded the higher class an opportunity to ostracize the jews to plunder them or to exile them worse than this outward dishonor was the influence of the badge on the jews themselves they became more and more accustomed to their ignominious position and lost all feeling of self-respect and lastly quote, the great misery of the Jews during the Middle Ages began with Pope Innocent the Third. If this was not bad enough, there was also an agreement to exterminate all those who opposed the Empire's power. Quote, the Twelfth Ecumenical Council held at the Lateran in 1215 under Pope Innocent the Third and attended by more than 400 bishops enacted a decree of excommunication and extermination against all heretics and their abettors End quote. 1483 a d to 1546 a d martin luther as mentioned earlier luther was a roman catholic priest who later created a german bible although he started out in defense of the jewish people he soon became disenfranchised with the jewish rejection of jesus their long-awaited messiah and he fell back into old roman beliefs and teachings luther rapidly went from defender to oppressor becoming a major promoter of hatred against the jews and all things related to the jews this is another page from luther's rare book which we will cover in the following chart as he describes in his own words in his book the jews and their lies published in fifteen forty three a shocking chart has been compiled called martin luther vs nazi legislation and actions chart to show just how close the nazis followed martin luther's suggestions we will let you go through the chart on your own which is also available to download for free at the torchbearerseries dot com website in order to understand the bible fully we will discuss in the third and last core session why the distancing from the jewish people and their ancient cultural biblical understanding is still very much relevant today eighteen forty six a d to eighteen seventy eight a d pope pius the ninth the following was written by samuel weed barnum who studied at yale and assisted with the revision of webster's dictionary in the eighteen hundreds the jews were even under pius the ninth compelled to live mainly in the ghetto or jewish quarter which is the lowest and filthiest region in rome separated by a wall from the rest of the city and situated on the east bank of the tiber opposite the north end of the island end quote. dr j g holland in eighteen sixty nine said of rome quote, is nothing but a show the rome of to-day is indeed nothing but a great museum of curiosities papal and pagan living and dead the lovers of light and liberty are pining in her political prisons her multitudinous beggars are licensed like porters and go around the streets with brass tickets hung to their necks End quote much could be said about this lineage stream from eighteen seventy eight to the present time but for the sake of time let's continue we will now summarize section four one thirty five a d to one hundred and ten a d ignatius promoted god's laws for mankind as being jewish only laws two one hundred and fifty a d to two hundred and fifteen a d clement was the first known to allegorize scripture he also followed plato's greek philosophical teachings and was a product of the alexandrian school system three one hundred and sixty a d to two hundred and forty a d julius africanus first known strong promoter of the cephite theory and also attended the alexandrian school system four one hundred eighty four a d to two hundred and fifty four a d origin 
He was a strong promoter of the allegorization of most scripture, and also followed the Greek philosophy of Plato. 5. 731 AD, Pope Gregory III. Under his watch, the worship of images became general practice in Roman-controlled churches. 6. 85 AD to present time. Replacement theology, or also called supersessionism, was first recorded to start with the Gnostic and extreme anti-Jewish Marcion, and continued with many who had an association with Rome, including, but not limited to, Justin Martyr, Constantine I, Pope Innocent III, Martin Luther, and Pope Pius IX. As a word of warning, most if not all of the information you will find available from Roman sources in the past, as well as modern times, will try their best to associate the heretical groups of Arians, Manichaeans, and others to the different torchbearer groups in order to slander them. There has been a consorted effort since the time of the apostles to the present time to drive a wedge between Jews and Gentiles who follow Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah, and between Jewish cultural understanding and Gentile understanding of the Bible. Could it be that if both prospective sides were to get together, people would find clarity to the Bible that the ancient torchbearers were willing to suffer for? We will now begin our last and shortest lineage column to review. Those in this lineage stream have almost always one thing in common. They deny Christ's deity. Is it only coincidence that most of today's non-Christian occult groups, pseudo-Christian cult groups, New Age mysticism, and many modern secret societies started in the 1800s at the same time the doubting Bibles began? 30 AD to 90 AD, Simon Magus, Galatius, and Theodos. It has been stated of Simon, quote, The system of uniting Christianity with Gnosticism began with that heretic. What Simon Magus began was brought to perfection by Valentinus, who came to Rome in the former part of the second century, end quote. One of the many common heretical beliefs of the Gnostic schools is that, quote, the God of the Old Testament was not the Father of Jesus Christ, that there was no resurrection or final judgment. End quote. Gnostics would often pick and choose what they wanted to believe from Eastern principles, Jewish Kabbalah, and Plato's Platonic philosophy. Thus, they could be considered an eclectic type of religious belief system. Paul warns against the quote, worshiping of angels, end quote. See Colossians 2.18. Yet in a book from 1829 we read, quote, It is said by Tertullian that Simon Magus worshipped angels, and that he was rebuked for this by St. Peter, as for a species of idolatry, end quote. As notorious as Simon Magus, Galatius, and Theodos were, who lived during the time of the apostles, their students, Basilides, Valentinus, and Marcion, became even more notorious Gnostics of their time period. 100 AD to 160 AD, Valentinus, disciple of Marcion, an early Christian Gnostic theologian leader, an influential heretic, Valentinus and Marcion's followers would 1. Reject the Old Testament 2. Reject the Law and Prophets 3. Reject the physical resurrection of Jesus 4. Reject marriage 5. Reject the Apocalypse 6. Believed physical matter is eternal, from Greek philosophy 7. Mutilated the meaning of the New Testament and more 256 AD to 336 AD, Arius of Alexandria, a presbyter, leader, of Alexandria, who put forth a system of denying the divinity of Christ, and regarding him only as the first and most excellent of created beings, which denies the Trinity. This system, called Arianism, was rightly condemned at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. But these heretical ideas have not gone extinct and still exist to this day. The modern-day followers of Arius dramatically increased in the 1800s. 
like many other christian cults that sprang up as a direct result of the influx of heretical manuscripts forgeries and doubting bibles that followed after westcott and hort introduced their unbelieving and corrupted texts an example of modern-day arianism is the religion of jehovah's witnesses who deny christ's deity this is made clear as stated on their official website quote, the god of the bible is never described as being part of a trinity end quote. since this is such a widespread issue we will provide ample biblical evidence for the trinity later in this session but for now we will provide just one verse quote, for there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one end quote. first john chapter five verse seven jesus is described as quote, the word end quote, in the bible multiple times such as in john one one john one fourteen and revelation nineteen thirteen the trinity is a confusing topic for many and no one should fault anyone for having confusion on this subject which also confuses the best of scholars but jesus was crucified for claiming to be god jehovah's witnesses unfortunately go one step further than denying the trinity and step into the realm of the heretical gnostics with the bizarre belief that jesus was the archangel michael as described on their official website unlike the arian view which had come about during the time of the apostles and was rightly condemned as heresy at the council of nicaea in 325 a d the modern heretical concept of jesus as an archangel was not known as a held belief by anyone during the time of the apostles nor by the followers of the apostles and not even by the time the council of nicaea met in 325 a d however gnostics were known to venerate angels Note, for some reason, many modern Aryan leaders will selectively quote from the Encyclopedia Britannica while leaving out crucial information or by providing selective information out of context. 260 AD to 340 AD, Eusebius Pamphili, also known as Eusebius of Caesarea, he supported the ideas of Constantine the First, Arius, and Origen nothing else probably needs to be said about him three fifty four a d to four thirty a d aurelius augustine also known as augustine of hippo he was another follower of plato's greek philosophical teachings the first non-gnostic to promote amillennialism and convinced the roman church that the thousand-year reign of christ had already started with the first advent first coming of christ before we continue we should define two terms for those who don't know amillennialism is the rejection of the belief that jesus will have a literal thousand year long physical reign on earth premillennialism is the belief that jesus will physically return to earth the second coming and reign before the millennium for a literal thousand year golden age of peace note when we say millennium we are not speaking of the year 2000 A.D. or 3000 A.D., but instead the time period in which Christ will rule for 1,000 years. The early church had always been premillennial and believed in the physical resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. Quote, it is commonly agreed by the best modern historians that from the death of the apostles till the time of origin premillennialism was the general faith of those who were regarded as strictly orthodox christians premillennialism was quote, already received by gentile christians before the close of the first century and was expressly rejected during the first half of the second century only by most gnostics end quote. augustine also adopted the sethite theory and promoted the allegorization of scripture not to the extent that clement and origen did but well beyond the normal known figures of speech contained within the bible 1830 a d the book of mormon translated by joseph smith from supposed tablets obtained from a claimed deceased person named morani 
In reality, Smith's wife said he had a diseased mind. He was wanted by police and arrested on multiple criminal charges, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. There really isn't a reason to go deeper into this group, whose founders were wanted in multiple states for serious crimes and who claimed communication with spirit beings under false pretenses. For those who would like to read up on why troops were called in to deal with the situation, obtain a free trial subscription to newspapers.com and search in the 1800s for the word Mormon. In doing this, you will find dozens of old scanned newspaper articles spanning across numerous states in the United States of America, with the reports of suspected criminal con artist activity and more. The example newspaper article shown is the specific location where Joseph Smith's wife said he had a diseased mind. 1945 AD, the Nag Hammadi. These are Gnostic texts that were found in 1945 AD and suspected to date around 376 AD, though this may turn out not to be the case. However, we won't take up any more time on these Gnostic texts. There is little doubt that additional fragmented Gnostic and heretical texts will continue to be discovered and dug out of the ground in Egypt and elsewhere. It is worth providing the following warning. It is quite possible that at some point in the future, a new discovery will likely take place that purportedly disproves prior long-held biblical beliefs. It also would not be surprising if this text turns out to be an actual ancient heretical manuscript, but it could also be, in reality, a modern forgery that was skillfully composed with an overstated date and thus will be placed above other manuscripts that have more evidence and support on their side. In either case, it will likely pass chemical tests and other scrutiny thrown at it. This new fraud of the future should be easy to predict, since if you were a fallen angel, what better way would there be to create massive doubt and destroy faith in God's word amongst those who are already using doubt-inducing Bibles, also known as doubting Bibles? We will now summarize section 5. 1. 30 AD to 90 AD. Simon Magus credited with being the first heretic to create a system of uniting Christianity with Gnosticism, but he surely wouldn't be the last. 2. 100 AD to 160 AD, Valentinus, a Christian Gnostic theologian leader who followed Greek philosophy. You may or may not have noticed that Westcott and Hort, who worked on creating a new Greek New Testament text, also followed Greek philosophy and Gnostic beliefs. 3. 256 AD to 336 AD Arius, a leader of Alexandria who put forth a system of denying the divinity of Christ and the Trinity. Jehovah's Witnesses are a modern-day example of Arianism, combined with a Gnostic belief that Jesus was the Archangel Michael. 4. 260 AD to 340 AD, Eusebius, supported the ideas of Constantine I, Arius, and Origen. 5. 354 AD to 430 AD, Augustine, the first non-Gnostic to promote the heretical amillennialism belief. He also adopted the Sethite theory, the allegorization of scripture, and Plato's Greek philosophical teachings. Six. 1830 AD, Book of Mormon, a modern example of what happens when occult divination practices are combined with and superimposed upon the Word of God. We have now entered the bonus section of this lecture session. Since it is often helpful to see how other ancient manuscripts stack up to each other, as far as accepted evidence is concerned, we will briefly look at the Eclectic Manuscripts Comparison Chart Bibliographical Test. Each area of the chart has been researched, updated, and has references added corresponding to the latest information per the date listed at the top of the chart. The manuscript totals in the chart will continue the change as a result of new manuscripts being discovered that are held within private collections and unidentified manuscripts stored in universities and museums.
therefore the chart should only represent a best effort having covered the importance of b raid and the unbroken manuscript chain of custody also known as umcoke in the previous session you should be familiar with the crucial role b raid and umcoke play in obtaining one hundred percent accuracy as a side note the references for the chart are not displayed within this lecture but are available in the supplemental lecture notes and within the separate free downloadable chart as represented by the one displayed here christianity began when jesus started his ministry at around thirty years old but there has been much scholarly debate on what exact year he started his ministry however there is sufficient evidence to reasonably conclude that he started his ministry in twenty seven a d or within three years of that date and continued for only a few short years the official start of the christian church was on pentecost which occurred a few weeks after christ's death and resurrection the end of new scripture would have occurred when john wrote revelation between approximately sixty six a d to ninety six a d according to worldatlas.com christianity has two point two two billion followers as of september tenth two thousand and eighteen the jewish sacred text is also the christian old testament text which christians should also hold in equally high esteem as the new testament text according to worldatlas.com judaism has thirteen point nine million followers as of september tenth two thousand and eighteen all of islam's various original quran versions from 634 a d to 663 a d were collected and destroyed by uthman ibn affan who was the second cousin and son-in-law to muhammad in the year 653 a d and was rewritten this newly rewritten and standardized version was distributed in 653 a d and is called the uthmanic codex therefore there is no way to verify the accuracy of the new uthmanic codex versions compared to the originals and thus logically there is also no way for a quran manuscript to ever date older than the year 653 a d since that would be before uthman collected and burned all original versions according to worldatlas.com islam has one point six billion followers as of september tenth two thousand and eighteen hinduism has no single belief system and instead comprises of several varied and changing systems of philosophy belief and ritual hindu texts fall into one of two categories shruti heard or smriti remembered text shruti heard scriptures are considered divinely inspired and fully authoritative for belief and practice with the only text falling into this category is the vedas the smriti remembered texts are generally considered the most recent and are recognized as the products of the minds of the sages despite the smriti's lesser authority they are the most representative of actual hindu beliefs and practices since the collection of the hindu text called the upanishad is considered sacred scripture by most hindu traditions this is what was counted in the manuscript chart the manuscripts were said to be composed from seventeen hundred b c and continued to be composed throughout the early modern era of sixteen hundred a d thus the religious texts have been ever-changing many of the older texts have undoubtedly not survived as a result of being written on short-lived palm leaves and birch bark according to worldatlas.com hinduism has one billion followers as of september tenth two thousand and eighteen buddhism originated in ancient india between the sixth and the fourth centuries b c and was founded by a hindu teacher siddhartha gotama otherwise known as buddha buddha means awakened one or teacher siddhartha never claimed to be a god or a prophet the buddhist main dominant text is the sutras but there is overlap between the text used by hindus and buddhists most people believe that the dalai lama is the leader of the buddhists but this is far from true 
the dalai lama is the head of the newest school of tibetan buddhism that was founded between 1357 a.d and 1419 a.d which doesn't show up on many of the historical buddhism timelines this type of buddhism is called galu also known as the yellow hat school the dalai lama has an extremely large office palace located in india in contrast to their perceived humble lifestyle buddhism is the only religion of these top five religions that do not believe in an intelligent creator god which is refutable by two firm realities irreducible complexity and the law of entropy according to worldatlas.com buddhism has four hundred and eighty eight million followers as of september tenth two thousand eighteen also included in the chart are some classical works homer's iliad writings by aristotle and plato's tetralogies this is just to give you a feel for how some non-religious texts compare next we will address some of the claims made about jesus by people of other religious affiliations as either being merely a good moral teacher a prophet or a wise man can any of these views be true in light of jesus proclaiming to be god let's go over twelve bible verses about jesus as god in a quick chart so that everyone is clear on what the bible is stating about jesus then we will look at the lewis's trilemma chart jesus says he is god decision and see what options are available one isaiah nine six quote, for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counsellor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace End quote. 2. Matthew 1.23 quote, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us, End quote, which is a reference back to the Old Testament. Quote, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. End quote. Isaiah 7.14 So we have confirmation from the Old Testament as well that the Jews were expecting God incarnate. Many Jews who follow Jesus understand this today. These Jews are called Messianic Jews. 3. Matthew 28.18 And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. End quote. 4. John 1 1 quote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. End quote. 5. John 1 14 quote, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. End quote. 6. 1 John 5 7 quote, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. End quote. 7. John chapter 5 verses 22 through 23. Quote, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him End quote. eight john eight fifty eight quote, jesus said unto them verily verily i say unto you before abraham was i am End quote. this is in reference back to the burning bush encounter in the old testament quote, and god said unto moses i am that i am and he said thus shalt thou say unto the children of israel i am hath sent me unto you End quote. exodus three fourteen nine john ten thirty quote, i jesus and my father are one End quote. ten john fourteen nine quote, jesus saith unto him have i been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me philip 
he that hath seen me hath seen the father and how saith thou then show us the father End quote. eleven john twenty twenty eight quote, and thomas answered and said unto him jesus my lord and my god End quote. thomas having seen jesus raised from the dead realizes who jesus is jesus a trained jewish rabbi never attempts to correct thomas for calling him lord and god because jesus is lord and god twelve first timothy three sixteen quote, god was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit seen of angels preached unto the gentiles believed on in the world received up into glory end quote. there are hundreds of examples of jesus fulfilling old testament prophecies many fulfilled by the actions of his enemies which fulfilled the jews long-awaited messiah's first coming as the incarnated one true god see references for details if any one is confused on how god can be three in one or feels that the trinity is a mistake in doctrine please read the two short articles written on creation dot com referenced below we have also included a chart that can be downloaded for free which provides a small example of the dozens of overlapping titles and attributes of god the father god the son and god the holy ghost also known as the holy spirit as you can see from this chart the title and attributes of god lord yahweh creator father savior having a separate will and is distinct can raise the dead and is the ultimate judge are all equally shared between the father son and holy ghost as we take a look at the chart so named the lewis's trilemma chart after the widely famous author c s lewis who is perhaps most recognized for his christian books and the narnia series it is recognizable that there are only three distinct paths there are three decision paths on the chart starting on the leftmost one we read if jesus knew his claims were false jesus knowingly misrepresented himself jesus was a liar jesus was a hypocrite jesus was a demon jesus was a fool for he died for it and the outcome jesus cannot be a wise man a moral teacher a good teacher a good prophet a good angel or a good alien option number two is jesus did not know his claims were false which would mean jesus was sincerely deluded jesus was a lunatic and the outcome still is jesus cannot be a wise man a moral teacher a good teacher a good prophet a good angel or a good alien the third and last option is jesus's claims were true jesus is the lord god outcome you can accept god or you can reject god c s lewis recognized that jesus did not leave many options open nor did he intend to in how people thought of him these bonus sections were intended to provide you with a bit more detail on manuscripts and a glimpse of the evidence available for lord jesus christ being god in this second core lecture session we have answered the following questions one is there an unbroken manuscript chain of custody of jesus's preserved teachings answer yes the many torchbearer groups have preserved the truth up to the time the king james bible was written two which modern bibles or bible are a hundred percent reliable and why answer the king james bible is one hundred percent reliable because the true hebrew and greek texts were passed on to these believing translators and many of the forty-seven translators if not all of them were themselves torchbearers three did the romanized christians fully conform to what lord jesus christ taught answer no those who followed rome and later the roman church never fully followed lord jesus christ's teachings the primary goal for rome was not to follow christ but was to combine the different religions within their empire and create a new compromised and unifying religion which they named roman catholic four 
why did the roman emperor constantine the first alter god's fourth commandment answer to completely separate from everything associated with the jews who always rebelled against rome and by doing so denounce any jewish connection to the newly formed universal catholic roman empire religion which was far different from the christianity followed by the twelve apostles of christ and by the jewish gentile torchbearers constantine's plan was the same as past and future emperors as later popes unify the diverse empire within a single new state-approved religious belief system in order to maintain and to obtain more control over the population if a person didn't comply different tactics were implemented to shame persuade cut off benefits persecute deport and if all else fails execute which occurred even before constantine's time see the below reference for additional details in a few moments we will provide a preview of what will be covered in the third and final core lecture series session but right now we would like to extend a call to accept and follow lord jesus christ who is god a human judge cannot be both merciful and just at the same time since if he always sentences a person to the punishment he deserves he is just but he is not merciful yet if he is merciful and doesn't sentence a person to what he deserves then he provides mercy but he is not just god is completely holy and righteous and god must uphold his own laws so someone must be punished for the crimes committed against him however no one can take another person's place for the punishment unless they are completely pure and without sin so god himself is the only one that can be both merciful and just at the same time by ensuring justice is done and that he jesus being without sin having not committed any crime can suffer our punishment in our place we have to agree to allow him to take our place to receive mercy if we don't we must be judged and punished for our crimes our sins i strongly encourage you to diligently seek additional information if you are not yet ready to accept that god entered into our physical reality as lord jesus christ in order to die in your place for your crimes and your sins against god if you are ready to accept his sacrifice on the cross to pay for your crimes sins then say the following wholeheartedly out loud or you can say it to yourself in your heart if there's other people around dear heavenly father i realize that i have broken your laws and have always deserved your punishment please forgive me of my crimes against you i believe and trust that your son lord jesus christ paid for my sins when he died on the cross and that i have been forgiven and cleansed of every crime i have ever committed against you i welcome you into my heart and life to mold me into the person you meant for me to become please provide for me a new heart and mind that is always focused on your good and righteous ways for my part i will seek to know more about you and your ways and to keep your ways so i may have stronger faith trust and love for you and your ways that continues to grow with time in the name of your son jesus the christ the messiah amen it's up to you to decide if what you learned is both reasonable and probable please join us in our next and final session where we will provide the restored core doctrine also known as beliefs of the torchbearers that you may want to understand in the next session we will cover one the seven golden rules of bible interpretation two christian torchbearer doctrines the basic beliefs three justification salvation through diplomatic status four sanctification holiness for inheritance rewards and crowns five glorification god's ultimate love six two wines understanding the hidden biblical importance seven the sabbath end of the bride and bridegroom mystery until next time 
May God always provide you with an open heart, mind, and spirit to follow him and his ways, above our own ways and above the ways of man. All credit, praise, honor, and glory belongs to our beloved God. Amen.